Thanks. I'd like to welcome everybody to the November meeting of the Manhattan Community Board One's Transportation and Street Activity Permit Committee. Um, I'm Betty Kay, Chairman of the committee. Um, I'm joined by the co-chair, Michael Francoeur, as well as the district manager, Lucian Reynolds, who will be the host on this particular meeting. Michael's gonna help me out with the slides. So when you hear me talking a lot, uh, I wanna let you know at the beginning, the agenda has been adapted. You'll see there are multiple items that have been postponed, so they will not be covered tonight. Hopefully you'll get home with some time to yourself. But I'd really like to start, if you go to the next one, we'll start with the city bike infill since we have the team here. And so Jackie, if you'd like to introduce your team and take over. First, thank you. Um, good evening, everyone. My name is Jackie Lazaro. I'm from DOT's Manhattan Borough Commissioner's Office. I'm joined by uh, my colleagues at our bike share unit, Lauren and Jesse. And today we're gonna discuss uh, city bike expansion and infill plans. Um, Lauren, do you want to please take a go ahead? Sure. Hi, everybody. Thanks for having us. Um, Lauren Deutsch, I'm the Chief of Staff for DOT's Bike Share and Shared Mobility Program. Uh, and I'll be presenting today. Um, and Jesse will be here joining us as well to help answer any questions at the end of the presentation. So let me share my screen. Okay. I may need to give you privileges. This is, and it is, um, oh, Lucian's got it. You're on it. Yes. Okay. Great. Okay. Can you see? Sorry. I'm going to stop sharing and show a different screen. Full screen. Great. Hi. Okay. So again, I'm Lauren Deutsch, Chief of Staff for DOT's Bike Share and Shared Mobility Program. Thanks again for having us here. Uh, tonight we're gonna talk a bit about City Bike Infill and our proposal for Manhattan Community Board One. Um, we'll do a quick overview of City Bike, which I know you're all familiar with, talk some more about the infill project itself our enhanced data-driven planning process, and then finally, what you have all been waiting for is the site-specific proposal. Um, so I'll just kind of quickly run through what is City Bike. Like I said, I think we're all pretty familiar with the program. It's been uh, it's New York City's bike share system, been on the ground since 2013 and operates 24-7, uh, 365, which is like New York. Bike share, it's intended for point-to-point -point transportation. It's a sustainable and healthy way to move around the city. Um, and it's a public private partnership between the city of New York and Lyft. So DOT is responsible for all of the planning and outreach while Lyft is responsible for day to day operations and maintenance of the system. Uh, and no city funds are used to run the system. It's supported solely by revenue generated from membership and other rider fees. Um, so city bike to date. Like I said, uh, City Bike has been on the streets in New York City since 2013. First launched in Manhattan, south of 60th Street, uh, and also in some parts of downtown Brooklyn, with just 330 stations and 6,000 bikes. Two years after, so popular, uh, it expanded to both the Upper East and Upper West sides of Manhattan, deeper into Brooklyn and into Queens for the first time, doubling the number of bikes and stations in the system. And then in 2019, Lyft acquired City Bike and announced phase three, a major investment that would more than double the existing service area to 70 square miles, triple the number of bikes to over 40,000, uh, and it would make our bike share system the largest in the world outside of China. Um, so City Bike is now in four boroughs. We're still expanding to new parts of the city, uh, and also we're still adding capacity to the highest demand areas. Um, and the system is really quite popular. So ridership is very high. Um, since launch in 2013, there have been over 135 million trips taken on a city bike. So this ad averages out to be about five trips per bike per day at this time. Um, but during peak season, the busy spring and summer and fall months, we routinely see over 100,000 trips a day. And in 2021 alone, we saw multiple 120,000 plus rides per day. 
And also, despite the pandemic, city bike ridership didn't collapse the way that other modes like subway and bus did. Uh, and in 2019, ridership was at 95% of 2019 levels. So let's talk a little bit more about phase three, uh, our very ambitious project. It's it's actually two but distinct, two distinct but linked efforts, expansion and infill. Um, so expansion brings city back to new parts of New York. We're almost halfway done with our expansion. Um, while infill adds new capacity to the existing service area. And our plan is to be done with both expansion and infill, infill installations by 2024. Um, so why is infill part of phase three? So we can talk a bit more about why we need infill. Uh, new and additional dock capacity is really critical uh, and it's needed in the busiest parts of the service area to meet increased demand as the entire system grows. Um, infill helps the system function and rebalancing is something that I believe that we've talked about with you in the past, but it's not alone to, it's not enough alone to accommodate increasing demand as the system and ridership both grow. Uh, so it's critical to smooth overall operations. So timeline and principles for infill. Um, our overall goal for over four years is to add an additional 16,000 docks. Uh, we're currently around 35% done with our infill project. Uh, site selection for infill is driven by demand and also by filling network gaps. And I'll discuss that uh, a little bit more a bit further on in the presentation. Um, but infill so far, we know we came to last year. It's been a rolling and iterative process uh, and we install multiple boards at the same time. Um, and then just some high level points about our planning, planning process. We combine a number of inputs as part of our station siting and station sizing process. So we incorporate community feedback via our feedback portal. We use a data driven demand and spatial analysis model, and that shows us the best places and appropriate sizes for stations. Uh, so we, so to, so as to ensure infill does its job. And we work together with Lyft and, of course, Jackie and Ed and their team to notify stakeholders in advance of installations. Um, and then the stations go down and they're monitored and maintained over time. Okay. So let's take a little closer look at our data driven process. And this is something that we've been working on more closely in the past year. So our high level goal with infill is to improve the system by reducing instances where riders can't find a bike or can't find a free dock, and which are problems that plague the system. Uh, to help us solve this problem, we created a model that looks at existing ridership patterns and identifies areas where we need to increase system capacity to meet rider demand. So if you take a look at this map, you'll see this is the whole phase one and phase two area, and that's where we've modeled. Uh, and you can see that there's demand in many parts of the system. There are some places where uh, there's no demand or no additional docks needed, um, but the most intense demand is in Manhattan south of 60th Street. And now we can zoom in on your community board. Uh, and as you can see, there's there's demand across the whole board, while some areas have a greater intensity of need. Um, and one thing to note is one of the limitations of this model is that it measures demand where there are only existing stations. And as we all know, there are some areas where there are no stations that are close to each other. So we also created a gap map to help us identify areas in the system that are furthest from another station. Um, we then combined these two layers of analysis, both the demand model and the gap map to create a powerful station sizing and siting tool. And this is the, this is the two uh, overlaid with each other, the demand, the different colors, the blue, uh, different colors of blue showing the gaps. Uh, and then with those two overlaid, that's, that's how uh, in part we selected our, our stations that are part of the proposal for tonight. Um, so the results show us that in Manhattan Community Board 1, we need 1,278 1, docks. Um, we're proposing about half of those, half of that need tonight in our proposal. So we, our plan is uh, to show you 651 docks worth of stations. Um, and th they come in a variety of forms. Um, there's, one ex there's some extensions, there's some new stations, there's some reinstallations and some relocations. Um, so, 
so the next part of the presentation is the site list. Um, you can slow me down. Let me know if I'm moving too quickly. And like I said, we can discuss this information and go through any questions you may have at the end of the presentation. Um, I'll just explain the key here uh, and the map a bit. So I believe there's three maps for this proposal. Uh, each number on the map corresponds to the site and its place on the list on the left side of the screen. The different colors correspond to the station type. Uh, so red for new station, a green for reinstallation, a blue for relocation, and a teal for a station, existing station extension. Um, and with that, I'll read through the list. So um, on battery, on the south side of battery place, at Greenwich Street, we will install, uh, we will reinstall a sidewalk station. Um, on the west side of Whitehall Street at Bridge Street in the pedestrianized roadbed, we will install a new station. On the east side of Broadway at Morris Street, we uh, are proposing a new roadbed station. On the east side of Greenwich Street at Rector Street, we are proposing a new roadbed station. On the north side of Albany Street uh, at the, the BPC Esplanade, we are in proposing a new roadbed station. Um, and at Water Street, at Fletcher Street, we are proposing a relocation from the POPs in the east roadbed. Okay, so next next slide. Um, Broadway Park, Broadway, I'm sorry. <laughs> On the east side of Broadway at Park Place, uh, we are proposing a new sidewalk station. Um, at River Terrace, in the west side of River Terrace at Warren Street, we're proposing a new roadbed station. On the west side of West Street at Chambers Street, we are proposing an existing sidewalk station extension. At Church Street, on the west side of Church Street and Thomas Street, we are proposing a new roadbed station. Uh, next slide. Uh, on the west side of Hudson Street at Northmore Street, we are proposing a new roadbed station. On the west side of Washington Street at Vestry Street, we are proposing a new roadbed station. Uh, on the west side of 6th Avenue at White Street, we are proposing a new roadbed station. On the north side of Walker Street at Center Street, we are proposing a new roadbed station. And that's the end of the presentation. I'm so happy to talk through any questions uh, you may have. Thank you. Uh, and let me start the questioning then with Michael. Oh, great. Thanks, Betty. And uh, yeah, thanks, Lauren, for that presentation. That was really that was really great. It was really nice to see the the maps, the data visualization that your team worked on. So thank you so much. It really is illuminating to see um, to, to help us see where, uh, you know, gaps are where need is, because it can be tough for us to, you know, figure that out without having access to that same data set. Um, so I think my main question is, um, uh, there's been in past conversations in this committee um, and in the community board, uh, there have been concerns about siting of uh, city bike stations on uh, sidewalks um, for a few reasons. One being that you know it's taking space away from already crowded sidewalks, and b uh, it encourages um, uh, cyclists to bike on the sidewalk because they need to start and end their trip on a sidewalk. Mm -hmm. um, and that creates, um, you know, potential, you know, ops potential um, for collisions between pedestrians and cyclists on the sidewalk. Um, so I was just wondering for those locations that you uh, proposed that are on the sidewalk, if you could talk us through why it's on the sidewalk instead of the roadbed, um, and if something that if that's something that uh, you guys would be open to revisiting. Yes. So. It looks like we only have two sidewalk stations out of this proposal list, which I think, you know, we also agree we prefer to 
uh, site in the roadbed where possible. Um, definitely want to make sure pedestrian safety is paramount. Uh, and, you know, every city bike rider is a pedestrian at some point. Um, so, looks like the one sidewalk station is on Broadway and Park Place, and that's adjacent to City Hall Park. Um, and I think that we thought that that was a, uh, probably the best location. I can I can get some more information from the planners on our team about why this site was selected specifically over others. Um, Jesse, unless you know more about that site. Yeah, I don't know uh, about that specific site, um, but I think in general, like, we we understand there's so many competing uses of our streets and our sidewalks in general with, you know, as time goes on, there's even more sort of uses of our sidewalk and streets. So we try to, as much as possible, we try to balance it. Uh, we try to balance it out. Um, whenever there is a sidewalk station, um, we definitely make sure there's um, even more pedestrian cleared than what's required by law. Um, but I, I definitely think if there's like, you know, certain uh, like these sidewalk stations, we can for sure take like an additional look to see um, where possible. If a shift is sort of, uh, if a shift is possible, um, we're definitely open to the, to the idea. Um, just knowing that, you know, there's so much going on in this community board that, you know, it may not be possible just because of, you know, utilities and other right. sort of street uses. Right. And the other sidewalk station is, is the station extension. So that's an, you know, we wanted to capitalize on existing opportunities to extend wherever possible. And I think last year that was really the focus of our infill proposal and infill work. And so there weren't really many more station extension opportunities. So the ones left uh, we took. Got it. Thanks. And yeah, I would be open. I would. Love it if you guys revisited that, but I'll also, you know, see if the rest of the committee agrees with me. Um, back to you, Betty. All right. First, I want to point out that there's someone from the DOT bike share that is in the attendee list. If they could be moved over, so they could unmute themselves when they they have something to say. And then I'm going to go with Robert's rules, and we'll do committee members first. So let's have Jess, then Mitch, then Pat Moore. Thank you and thank you guys for uh, for joining us tonight. That was a great presentation. Um, my question is about when you mentioned that you're, you're only proposing half of the demand that you anticipate. Um, why is that? And do you have any plans for uh, when you would be proposing the rest? That's a really good question. Uh, I think at this point, you know, the way that we are viewing our infill project, it's iterative and also uh, as we continue to expand, it's also and commute patterns uh, regulate themselves. We, we just keep monitoring our stations uh, and the ridership and see what changes may need to be made over time. Um, so unclear as to what our immediate plans are to come back uh, to do to do more, um, but I think we felt just given the timeline in our equipment order constraints this year also uh, that the 638 docks that we're proposing at these 14 locations was uh, was a very achievable but ambitious target for this year. Got it. Thank you. Great, then Mitch. He's still muted. Mitch, you're unmuted, but we're not getting any sound from you. We got to check your micro microphone. Why don't you work on that and let's let Pat Moore speak. All right, I have a few issues. Um, one of my big problems is that so many people today, people are riding on the sidewalk. It's mm -hmm. illegal to ride on the sidewalk with your bikes. I do not see bike share doing its part to make that known and known to everyone that it is illegal to ride your bikes on the sidewalk. I just did a walking tour this morning with Rosa and we had people, we ran and counted people riding on the sidewalk on city bikes. So where is that, where is that, where's bike share, you know, doing their bit to make sure that people know they're not supposed to ride on the sidewalk. That's number one. Number two, the chart that showed us uh, where the need is for new bike docks 
Is that because of people dropping, not having enough space to drop off, or people needing they want the ride needs to emanate from there, so they need to be able to pick up a bike, or is it one and the same? I'm not sure I understood that chart. Um, do you want Jesse? I'm assuming you want to take the enforcement question, and I can talk about the demand. Yeah, then I have then my big problem okay. is the dot that's proposed at Greenwich and Rector. Okay. But yeah, I can I can talk a little bit more about the, the sort of sidewalk riding. So yes, that's something that we've seen um, on sidewalks, uh, you know, on sidewalk stations. Um, I think DOT and Lyft do their you know absolute best in trying to reinforce those no, uh, that messaging about it. Um, so like one of the things that uh, on every bike basket, um, there are the rules of the road. So not only like uh, sidewalk riding, um, there's also thing, uh, there's also messages about red lights, um, yielding to pedestrians, things like that. Um, in addition, on the kiosk itself, uh, if you're going to check out a bike, the rules of the road are printed there as well. Um, and whenever you become an annual member, um, along with the sort of uh, welcome package, a, um, a, a small sort of pamphlet uh, about the tips and tricks and the rules of the road are, are mailed to every new annual member. Um, you know, just trying to highlight again of like, these are the rules of the road. This is how you should be operating uh, a bike. Um, additionally, there are, you know, more general sort of education drives that uh, DOT accomplishes uh, throughout the year, whether it be at helmet fittings or sort of improv to, uh, um, Site, uh, street ambassador deployments where our outreach team uh, deploys at a very high traffic location to go over the rules of the road with people. Um, uh, so yeah, that's like what we try to do as much as possible. We understand that. I'm you know, sorry, Jesse. Sure. It isn't working. Number one, why isn't there some sort of campaign <laughs> in the city that works with the police? That you every time you become a bike share member, you should have to sign a contract that says, I understand completely and thoroughly that I am not allowed to ride on the sidewalk. Why are there not campaigns on TV, commercials on television, commercials at bus stations that say riding on the sidewalk is illegal? It is ha it happens constantly and people are almost hit constantly. And I don't I I as a non bike rider, I don't see any place where I would get that information that would tell me that it's illegal, except that I'm a community board member, so I know it's illegal. Other than that, I don't think anybody in New York understands that it's illegal. And truthfully, it's like when, you know, you say, oh, you know, that we can do it in But how do you know that people really read these pamphlets and know the rules of the, of the road? It has to be emphasized. It has to be discussed. They have to sign a contract. They have to be made aware that, you know, what, what are the penalties if they hit somebody? If they hit a pedestrian, what are the penalties? Well, I, I'm not, I'm not too well versed on the sort of liability. I know that uh, city bike has their sort of they, the city is not sort of liable for anything that happens on city bike's end. Um, but I can definitely take back the, you know, take back the suggestion to our, our communications team to sort of step up. Would you please? We've been there. for years and years. When, you know, when transportation was part of quality of life, we complained. We have complained for years and years about the fact of people riding on the sidewalk. It is illegal. I do not understand why there's not a huge campaign in New York City that says, do you know that bike riding is illegal on the sidewalk? Okay, so that's number one. Again, the chart, and thank you for trying to explain that, Jesse. And yes, I would appreciate you to take it back and come back to us with some complete answer about why everyone in New York City including when tourists come and get on city bike, that they are not told that it's illegal. Then the other thing is, again, the chart that shows the green areas where, you know, where you really needed to have new bike stocks. I don't understand if you need those bike stocks because people are dropping off their bikes uh, in great so numbers, mm -hmm. or if that's where the rides are starting. And I'm not sure if maybe it's one and the same. I, I think it's it's we look we look at all stations and we look for both, um, and so so yes, <laughs> um, 
Yes, we look at all stations and we look for both. We calculate instances where we look at instances where byte or stations that have all full docks or all empty docks. Uh, and then we look at them over time. We look at them over 15 minute increments, and then we use uh, that calculation to give us a factor uh, called accumulation. And then that gets factored into the calculation that goes into the model that makes the map. The map. So, okay, so, sure. you know, I mean, a station yeah. is essentially useless if you can't ride a bike or you can't dock a bike there. So that's the problem we're trying to solve for. So, yes, to, to your point, yes, they are one and the same in the sense that um, infill will would help or improve overall sis the system uh, operations by inc by increasing the instances where you can t get a bike or get a dock. So, uh, I'll have to think about that. Thank you. So specifically the Greenwich and Rector Street, as we all know, Greenwich South is this teeny tiny little area. We have five active streets. And truthfully, I mean, have you walked Greenwich South? Do you, I don't know who came up with citing this location, but it's a very tiny little mm -hmm. geographical area. We already have only five, you know, working streets. We have lots of construction projects. We have World Trade Center number five slated to start and go in there as well as all the other projects that are going on. We do not need any space taken away from sidewalks, roadbeds. We already have tons of traffic jams at Greenwich and Rector. And why do we need a bike dock specifically there? And what do we do to stop it from happening? <laughs> well, I, I, Per the, the map that we showed you, the overlay of both the demand map and the gap map, we found that this play, this was a particularly acute need in terms of a network gap. And that's one of the key components that makes the system rideable is that there's a certain level of reliability that you won't have to walk too far of a distance between stations in order to find a bike if one station is full of, um, you know, is empty or full, depending on whatever your need is, whether you're starting or ending a trip. Um, so this station was in a place where there's not any stations nearby uh, and, and we want to be precise in terms of the locations of where we're siting um, at this point in our planning process. So we are aiming for a very particular, um, like area of of this of the community board. So that's why we cited it there. Yeah, it might be unfair of me to ask you, but why aren't there other? I mean, there was one that was proposed to go on the site of um, Greenwich and Albany, and I don't think it's happening because World Trade Center Number Five is going to be built there. Do, it, can you confirm that? Um, was it in the the proposal tonight? I, I see no. Albany and Dead End. No. I see Greenwich and last Rector. Year. No, no, last no. Last year. year we were told it was going right, uh, Daddy and John and Mike. I'm sorry. Right. Yeah, I don't remember the exact street, but I think it was uh, uh, Albany. Right. It was right, right by the site of the new proposed building. It was about a year ago. And so, obviously, because of World Trade Center Number Five. The mm -hmm. construction that's probably going on in, I guess, a year or two. Mm -hmm. I, I assume that's why that site is not happening. Mm -hmm. And I mean, can you confirm or deny that or you know? um, I, we can, we can talk yeah. to our team and get some more background information. I don't have any of that in front of me yeah. right now. Well, I, think um, I think also, you know, we have been coordinating with. Uh, Port Authority, and there are just like numerous security concerns yeah. when it comes to siting. Um, on World Trade Center campus and around it. So um, there's just a lot of like additional considerations that maybe we wouldn't think of when trying to get stations on their site. There has been an expression of interest uh, for more uh, and new stations on the World Trade Center campus. So, you know, we're hopeful that we can do more there, but um, it's possible that that those additional siting constraints led to uh, that station getting like put off for a while. Okay, so World Trade Center site, they have, they have space. Greenwich and Vector, there is no space. So anyway, I'd like to, to know that we can do some sort of walking tour and you guys can look at this and we can have a in-depth discussion about that particular site. because that, I think, is a terrible place to put a, a bike station. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, and before going on to Mitch, uh, what I, I want to emphasize what Pat said about 
warning people do not ride on the sidewalk because there is nothing that's obvious and that we've asked many times mm -hmm. and even put something on the dock that only says no riding on the sidewalk that gets their attention as they pull the bike out and and i can we'll tell you them. i live across the street from a city bike dock and some of the biggest groups that i hit on the sidewalk are the tourists so as the tourists are coming back we're going to start seeing a lot more of that plus all the people who come who ride on the sidewalk because of covid has started it really badly and what are the penalties? They don't get penalized for any no, of it. Don't. The police don't say anything. The police yeah. know it's illegal. They see them. Nobody tells them, no, you can't do this, or you know, this is not allowed. What happens to you if you get caught riding on the sidewalk? Is there a fine? You go to jail? I mean, what happens? Well, the enforcement's kind of unlikely, but I just if we get some education, uh, it's got to be to the person at the time they're taking the bike out and yeah. very focused. I believe we do have stickers, rules of the road stickers in the baskets of the city bikes. Um, you know, whether people only. read them. <laughs> That's why it's gotta be something right. big that is no right. sidewalks. Yeah. I think, you know, we can we can talk to, as Jesse said, our comms team. We also have a safety education and outreach team um, and see, you know, what existing work may be out there and also work with our, our partner Lyft uh, on on rider education to, to really help make this point um, for casual riders, not just people who live in the city and can schedule a class. So um, thank you for voicing these concerns. And I think, you know, all of us walk the streets of New York. Nobody wants to get hit by a bike. So that would be a great irony to have a, a city bike uh, DOT employee get hit by somebody riding a city bike on the sidewalk. So I think we're, we understand that complaint and concern. Yeah, well, thank you. And I want to tell the attendees, put down your hands if you're done speaking, because I can't tell who's raising them again and who left them up. But anyway, Mitch, I'd promised you're next, so. Are you unmuted now? We also have one request from another colleague uh, who's sure. in the attendee room, Caitlin T. She's um, she's here to help out in case she needs anything, but perhaps she I can, let I can move her over. Mitch, Thank you. really quick, let me, if your microphone's not working, what I recommend, um, let me see, just watch what I'm doing here. You go over to your U button, there's a little drop down menu. You can go to switch audio. I don't know if you're seeing this. But you can call in. There's a call in option, and then you can just put your phone on speak. Call in and then put your phone on speaker, and that'll act as your microphone. That's a it's a good alternative. So just follow this, the directions from this option. Okay. I know. I know. I don't. I don't know why. Usually your microphone works fine. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. While Mitch is trying to get on, and we'll hear from him. Is that? Mitch, is that you? Okay, let's let Eric speak and then Gerald and Michael. Um, yeah, hi everyone. Um, I, I'm a cyclist as as well as an automobile driver, and I, I'm I'm worried about increasing the number of of city bikes on the road when when many of them don't. I'll give them the benefit of the doubt. They don't know the rules of the road. I mean, I, I think there needs to be some sort of uh, driver education course for them. I mean, a modified version that drivers take. I mean, they, they I don't think they know, oh, pardon, they don't stop at stoplights. You know, they, they cross across multiple lanes of traffic. It, it's a safety hazard for, for pedestrians and also for um, motor vehicle drivers. I mean, it, you, you got to watch for them because you know you don't know if they're going to stop turn in front of you so it's it's just a risk so that's my hesitation on increasing the number um but you know i understand the demand i i support increasing you know infill where there are dedicated lanes for cyclists like along the west side highway or or along the uh the um you know the east river but a lot of other places especially when the streets are narrow you know, we don't have space for cyclists on the road or on the sidewalk. I, I just want to be very careful about adding adding new docking stations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mitch. You unmuted. I mean, you called in. 
Okay, if he's still unable to speak, then let's go on to Gerald, then Michael. Yeah, hi, everybody. Oh, okay, I have a few questions here. Um, first off, uh, Lauren, how much revenue is generated by this program uh, for City Bike specifically? That's a great question. Um, and we're still in the process of uh, learning some of that information. I don't necessarily have it offhand. Um, <laughs> Wait, it's I'm different sorry. year by year. <laughs> Yeah, but, but I can I can try to pull some numbers. I mean, this is City you. Bank. This is City Bike. I mean, I I have I have credit cards with City. You're telling me you don't have the information. <laughs> city City. I don't have it offhand, but okay, like I said, I'd be happy enough. to take a take a look uh, at you and and it's a different number every year. I'm you know I'm happy to find some more information for you though. Okay, I, I'm sorry. I just um, I, City Bank I, is I, the I, sponsor. Right. City bike I understand is that you said that product. this is not costing the city any money, which I can respect. However, um, I am wondering how much uh, city bike in particular is is making not only from the bikes themselves, but also uh, I've noticed there's quite a few advertising um, programs that 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 launch through uh, city bike in particular, and stickers go on kiosks, stickers go on bikes. Um, it seems to be a pretty heavy advertising campaign happening through the bike share program. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I would like to get those numbers. If you could get those back to us, that would be great. Um, yeah. Also, then my next question is, um, well, I, the rules of the road, you mentioned that they were on the basket themselves. Um, I, I just looked up uh, on the internet a few of the city bike baskets and they're, uh, I do see where they're on the basket. Um, it, it seems to be that they may be uh, black and white. Um, I just want to reiterate with what Pat was saying and Betty and, and a few others with this issue of sidewalks. Um, I happen to know that the, the bicycle station, the docking station at Greenwich and uh, Warren, I, um, excuse me, I, Murray uh, in front of Target is on the sidewalk. Uh, it's on the um, south east portion of the sidewalk. That sidewalk has a very significant slope to it. Uh, what I've witnessed on a, on a daily basis now, both in the mornings and in the evenings, because I walk by there every day, uh, is that folks will do they, they'll, they'll um, engage the bike, uh, mount the bike and then coast down the sidewalk through the handicap ramp, through the um, ADA uh, curb cut ramp to get a good flow up and running into um, basically oncoming traffic. They have to, to cross over the intersection. Um, few, if any, that I've seen have actually paid any attention to the, the, the traffic uh, laws and traffic signals. But more importantly is the fact that they're coasting down the sidewalk to pick up speed. Um, and, and target is that particular entrance is probably one of the worst designed I've seen in the city. Um, but my point is there's a lot of people, a lot of pedestrians that go through there on a regular basis. And, and this is creating a very dangerous, I mean, forget the legality at this point. I'm just talking about a safety issue. Um, <clears throat> I, I think, uh, Jesse, you had said earlier that there are so many um, competing uses of our streets and our sidewalks. And I think that this is one of the issues that I have um, and, and is, is that there really aren't competing uses of the sidewalks. There's one use, it's pedestrians. Sidewalks are for pedestrians. So um, it really is on DOT, city bike, lift, to come up with a solution to get the bikes off of the sidewalks. Um, whether that's additional signage on the bike itself, whether that is some sort of- I just, I just um, muted myself. Tell I, me if you hear me in the background. We can hear you, Mitchell. Okay, you can hear me? Yes. We can hear you now. Sorry, I'll, I'll wait. I'll just be one more minute, thanks. No. Thanks, Mitch. Um, so, you know, whether that's at the kiosk, perhaps, where um, not just a long list of very difficult things to read that's, that, you know, that that's an agreement about returning the bike and not paying for it and stuff, but, but rather 
you know, maybe one large, we, we live in the day of graphics, one large graphic that says, you know, uh, 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 even if it's a bicycle on a sidewalk with a, with a, um, a slash. We move away from a uh, vehicle driven or vehicle centric city and, and a, perhaps a bit more towards a, a walkable city um, as well as one with with bicycles that it is it is something as far as signage is concerned that could happen at at the uh, street level at the at the sidewalks themselves again whether we have um, yield to pedestrian signs but I think there also needs to be something that says no bikes on sidewalks it just needs to be very very clear especially if we're adding well, let's see here. Twenty four thousand bi bicycles. That's that. We used, I think the the number was that we were up around sixty thousand. Um, it would be a total of uh, forty uh, by the end of all expansion. So that's including like uh, everything in the in the four boroughs. Okay, so uh, e even so, um, I think it was mentioned that it was going to be larger than 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 even China, China's amount of bicycles on on the road. Um, so we really need to start looking at this as more of a vehicular issue than a pedestrian issue, um, or or rather how vehicles and pedestrians are in interacting at this point, um, because it is it is very dangerous. Uh, that that same location I was talking about. Again, the other thing is people will ride up onto the sidewalk, um, you know, pick, try to pick up speed to get up the slope before they get to the docking station to dismount. Um, so the last thing I want to say on this is that uh, you mentioned that there were two proposed uh, sidewalk locations. I think uh, number nine was an extension of the sidewalk location um, that puts it down around the Esplanade, I believe. And that's another issue is we get a lot of people riding city bikes down mm -hmm. through the Esplanade where there is. Uh, We're losing you a bit, Gerald. Unless it's just me. Uh, I can hear me? Gerald, you cut out. I can hear you now. Okay. Just, what I was going to say is, please work with Hudson River Park. There is a uh, pedestrian. Uh, there is a bike pathway through through there. Uh, it's not just city bike riders, but uh, it says to um, yield to pedestrians, and that just never happens. I mean, people are doing fifty miles an hour on a bike down through there, and and you know, pedestrians are getting run over left and right. Um, my only final thing on that is please do not locate these on sidewalks, period. I, I, I just feel like it sends the wrong message. A person getting onto a bike is led to believe that they're permitted to ride on a sidewalk. So these should not be in a sidewalk. They should be located actually where, um, there are existing bike lanes in, in my opinion, and not, uh, you know, not even in, in a roadway, but where there are bike lanes. Thank you. Thanks, and I'd like to take this opportunity. I mean, first of all, I agree that we spread around because not everybody lives on a bike lane. And if that's their transportation, that's what they're going to take to get to and from where they live as well as where they're going to visit. But what I do want to point out is we are an international city and a lot of these groups that I see of cyclists, including those that were killed on Halloween four years ago, or three years ago, uh, are foreign tourists. They don't necessarily speak English or it's not their first language. So to consider international symbols when thinking about the education that's that's broader. So yeah, thank you. And please, I, please bring the numbers back to the committees. Please bring the numbers. Yeah, I actually was able to pull them. I was able them. to pull up some revenue share numbers. Um, so in fiscal year 20, the system generated nearly $593,000 in revenue for the city. Um, and, uh, and then in 21, uh, 1.28 million. Um, and there's some specific rules of the way that the revenue sharing agreement works. Um. The program's revenue exceeds thirty million dollars. The city share is five percent of the excess. Um, so those, so that's the amount of money that the city took in from the revenue share in, in the past two fiscal years. 
Thank you so much yeah. for that. Yeah. Thank you. That's very Yeah, cool. no, I mean, and I think, you know, we, again, like there's, you're, you're absolutely right. This is a transit system, um, but unlike many other transit systems, we don't, there's no subsidy. And so we also want to, you know, work with our vendor to make sure that they have opportunities to, to keep the system running. Um, and so ad revenue is one way that, that they can do that. So, yes, there are ads, but that's also part of the, the business model um, to maintain the, 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 the system. The, the sidewalks are actually my taxpayer dollars, your taxpayer dollars. Um, and, and that's a big part of this conversation is, is yeah. as a pedestrian, you know, maybe I can, maybe I can't go out and afford to ride a bike. I don't need to ride a bike to work. I'm, I, I've decided to locate myself in a place where I could walk to work. I'm very grateful for that. I don't want to be competing with bikes. Thanks so much, Lauren. Thank you. Mitch, did you have something you wanted to say? Yes, well, first I wanted to answer a question and then I wanted to add one or two things to what Pat and the previous gentleman said. Uh, Lauren, uh, the, uh, the church and Thomas Street uh, uh, location, is that going to be located on church or on Thomas? Because there are two different sizes. On church. Okay, then that was fine because I because Thomas is very very small, so fine. The pre the, the previous gentleman, uh, I just want to echo. He said something uh, very interesting that, as opposed to putting it on on a street or on on like like a a, a, a random like uh, where parking spaces are on the, a roadbed where there's an existing bike lane. Obviously, like Betty said, we can't you can't do it everywhere because they don't exist everywhere. But where they do exist, that would make perfect sense. And so if a bicyclist has to slow down a little because there's a bike, a, a bike station by the roadbed, but that, that seems to be a, a lesser of the three evils. The other thing is, uh, Pat had asked you a question about, is, is their city have any culpability if some a pedestrian gets injured? And you, you said no. So, and then you also said that the, uh, there's no contract that has to be signed by the, the, the user of the city bike, but I'm sure that, so, what I'm taking from that is the city was smart enough. I'm sure that they had their lawyers come up with a nice contract with city bikes, absolving them of any responsibility. So therefore, there has to be some type of responsibility assigned to the bike rider. And so, you know, that, that they're responsible for any damages. It, 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 you know, the city just can't absolve itself, but then there's no other responsibility because many of us, especially people that are, walking on pedestrians in the evening because of the, the the they don't work nine to five are hit on a weekly basis are almost hit on a weekly basis not just the city bikes but but you know the, the deliveries have a lot of to do with that so if you know there could be some type of contract because most people don't read the little stickers and even if people while i agree with betty that international signage is appropriate whether you speak the language or not when 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 you travel to another country and don't speak the language, you kind of know, you know, within a few minutes or, or or day, what the the you know when in Rome do as Romans do. So like you know, it's not totally an excuse just because you don't speak the language because there's international courtesy. So is there any possibility of having city bike riders sign something, which might put a little more maybe like pressure on on, on them to be a little more conscious. Yeah, Mitchell. Um, hi, this is Jackie from the Manhattan Borough Commissioner's Office. I'm up with DOT. Could you talk a little um, louder, please? Know, thank you. Oh, yep. Sorry. Can you hear me better now? A little. Thank you. Okay. Sorry. Um, yep. So, you know, thank you. First of all, thank you for that question. Um, in terms of, you know, what liability is, you know, I definitely would like to get some clarification because I would hate to give any misinformation. So I can definitely take that back and try and, you know, get further information and clarification. So, um, yep, but then in, and then, I'm sorry, could you repeat the second portion of your question for me? About, about uh, uh, the bike rider having to sign something, whether they sign up as a member or just on a per daily basis, uh, that they are responsible if, you know, for any, and, and any type of action that could happen as opposed to nobody being responsible because the city has absolved themselves. Okay, so I do believe, you know, we do have, like Jesse mentioned, the rules of the road on this on the bikes. 
And I believe also in the membership, you know, it does list again what the rules are when you sign up to be a city bike member. But um, again, I can take that back to get further clarification. My, but my question has nothing to do with the rules of the road being available. It has to be with signing up to be re, just like the city signs a contract that they, they're not responsible for anything with city bike. The, I, I, don't, I don't know. I mean, I asked the same question 3 times now, you know, can the person be made to sign something like what Pat said that, that they're responsible, just like when you rent a car, you know, it, it's, this is, uh, you know, I'm not talking about the rules being, being, uh, legible um i i would also like to uh point out that uh there are like terms and like terms in service when you whenever you sign up for for things like that um it's not maybe it's not as sort of uh i maybe ironclad as a contract as as you're as you're suggesting but that is like something that's well. Can, can so so that's a suggestion that Pat mentioned it first. I'm mentioning it. I'm sure there's a few other people that might that might feel that way because to be real, there is no enforcement, and unless there's enforcement in our culture, things are not going to change. I mean, there are yield signs, super legible as you enter City Hall Park from Broadway, and. That's never well, I don't say never 90% of the time. It's never enforced. I mean, it's never ab ab observed uh, uh, abided by by, you know, it's, it's basically a, a maze. You know, and there's 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 parents with strollers with little kids because I, I walk by there all the time that have to kind of, they have to be the ones to look out for the bikes coming around and behind them. So, unless there's enforcement, it's not going to change that much because we don't live in Japan or Singapore where they do things out of respect for others. So. Uh, unless there's, and I don't see enforcement happening, like, because there's so many other things going on. So, at least if somebody has to sign something where they feel there's more personal responsibility. That might help. So that's a suggestion. So it's not vague. Uh, uh, that's that's thank you. Hello. Thank you. Yes, okay. we, we, <laughs> thank you. Yes, yes. Sorry. Yeah, as mentioned before, um, you know, Jesse and I will work with Jackie and her team and um, and relay this information to our colleagues who do a lot uh, in terms of the outreach and communication space. And yeah, thank you. Totally, totally hear you. Thank you so much. Great. And since I've kind of forgotten the order, I'm going to. Michael, why don't you go to hear what you have to say? And then Eric sure. and Jess, I'm going to do you just in order. Yeah, I'll try to be quick. Um, I was just going to add, um, I am a city bike member uh, or have an annual membership. And I know a few months ago, uh, Lyft launched a new version of their app. And I do recall on initial launch that the, uh, the graphics were more prominent than they've been in the past. Um, you know, I'm not sure that that's enough for someone who's, you know, just a tourist and is new to the city. Um, but it's something I did notice. Um, so I'll just say that, uh, but I, I do agree with, I think what everyone says, I think the, the main issue is, uh, and I, I think I, I would favor, you know, a, an education based approach, uh, uh, in favor of an enforcement based approach, uh, just cause I know I, I did I think a year ago, I, I actually pulled the numbers for, um, uh, the enforcement of infractions for riding your bike on the sidewalk and they were severely uh, slanted towards people of color. I think it was like 80% were um, black or Hispanic. So, so it is a fraught thing. Um, uh, you know, whenever you have, uh, infractions like that, when we're asking for enforcement. So, uh, I, I would favor obviously education 1st, uh, you know, I, I know 1 thing that sometimes motivates cyclists riding on the sidewalk is not feeling safe on the road. So, obviously, you know, in this committee, we've been advocating for. Safer streets, you know, more bike lanes, et cetera. So that's something I think we all know that we need to we need to make progress on. Um, so I'll also say, as a city bike member, um, I've noticed the stress uh, of this on the system over the past uh, six to eight months. I've noticed that uh, it's difficult to find a dock uh, or a bike, and that's a severely frustrating or a very frustrating experience uh, for a member. Uh, I've contemplated 
canceling my membership, you know, as, as a result, because I also, I have my own bike. Um, so uh, I, I fully support this, you know, info program. I think it's important. I hope you guys are able to move quickly on it, um, you know, assuming that we can find the right spots. And um, uh, yeah, and I know it's been, <laughs> you guys, <laughs> it's, uh, I feel like I'm kicking horse uh, right now, but I agree with what everyone's saying about the sidewalks. Um, I know that there's some such, some places where you might say, hey, it's a really wide sidewalk, it's an esplanade. Um, but when we really are trying to educate uh, and make sure that riders aren't being on the sidewalk, citing, citing a, a, a dock on a sidewalk is a very, um, uh, it's a confusing prospect and it, it just, it will create conflict. Uh, also, if there's any way that we can revisit that, that dock by target, um, I've used that dock before. Um, and uh, it's not easy to dock there. Uh, it's a very, very busy street with the entrance of Target right there. So if there's anything we can do about that, that'd be great. Um, I think uh, I think that's it. Back to you, Betty. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, sorry. And I know moving that dock by Target is gonna be somewhat of a challenge is that in that borough Manhattan Community College is also located there one of their outlets. So there are a number of students that come in and out and, and rely on that dock and picking up a bicycle there. So do keep them in mind. What about across the street on the, like, you know, there's more space across the street uh, uh, going west. That's right. I'm not here to micromanage. I just wanted to keep in mind the constituency that is in that area to consider, so. Yeah, I would agree in that I, I've used the dock so many times because it is a valuable location. So I wouldn't advocate removing it, but I'm not removing it, for it off the sidewalk. Yeah, I think would be okay. optimal. Yes, no, I agree. It's slanted, and that's how I get to community board meetings. And since I'm a mobility device user, I always have to go riding on a slant, and so I keep sliding off my scooter. It's really it's it's difficult because the only flat space is given to the city bike stations. But anyway, let me get back to Jess and then Eric. So I, I want to just start by saying that I completely agree that we should do anything we can to, to get people to, you know, adhere to the rules of the road. And that includes people driving in cars, which by all measures is a far greater problem than people riding bikes. But um, I, I just want to respond to this idea that, you know, that we should get people to sign a contract or in, increase enforcement. It, there. Just like someone driving a car, if I get on a bike and I, and I hit someone and I'm breaking the rules of the road, I can be sued. And, and if you can prove that I'm breaking the law, you're, you're probably going to win. It's not like there's, there's no uh, penalties for people that are breaking the law and, and that hurt people. I think the reason we don't hear about uh, greater enforcement and, and lawsuits against people in bikes is because, um, you know, from all the information I've seen, the, the safety record of people riding city bikes is close to stellar. Um, so, you know, I think the idea that we would, you know, attach, you know, greater penalties or, or impose some sort of special obligation on people riding bikes, um, is the exact opposite of what we should be doing as is, you know, the idea of, um, giving the police more reasons to, to interact with people and harass people riding bikes. Um, so, you know, I think that I'm on board with, with doing anything we can to get people to follow the rules of the road, but, um, imposing special obligations on people riding bikes, um, increasing the powers of the NYPD or, or what's in their purview, I think is, is totally um, the opposite of what we should be doing and would discourage people from, from riding bikes. Thank you for that, Jess. Are, are, you, is, are you done? Yeah, I'm done, thank you. Great, no, thank you so much. Uh, then let's go on to Eric and then Pat Moore. Yeah, um, I, I just want to say, and, and and this is to you, Jess. I mean, it's just to your comment. Uh, I, it's it's a road. It, it's shared shared use. You know, there needs to be penalties. You know, not it's it's not to be punitive. You know, but there has to be some consequence for people's actions when they don't um, adhere to you know to the rules of the road. Um, just like automobile drivers must adhere to you know rules for people's safety. And also, you know, among each other, uh, cyclists need to have have the same same rules. Um, otherwise, it'll just be chaos on 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 the roads. Again, it's 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 not to punish them or, or, but there needs to be some enforcement and a penalty. 
Don't disagree. Great. And Eric, if you're done, then if Pat, if you'd like to speak. And just quickly, I just wanted to say to Jess, Jess, I don't know if you know, it's illegal. I'm not asking for something special. It is already illegal. And there has to be some sort of enforcement of the fact that we have a rule in the book that says it is illegal to ride on the sidewalk unless you're like, I think, under the age of eight. And no one seems to know that and no one is enforcing that. Uh, that that's what I have to say. I, I, I just want to say I don't disagree. What I'm, I'm objecting to is the idea that we should impose special obligations or special enforcement on people riding bikes because it, but right it's not now, special it's illegal if nobody knows that it's illegal then if, if if you tell everyone that it's illegal and it's clear to everybody it's illegal and they still ride on the sidewalk then they should be penalized if they don't know that it's illegal then we need it's our job or the city's job to make sure that they know that it's yeah. illegal I agree, and and people, but people get penalized on bikes all the time. I mean, I, I my my I've gotten a ticket on a bike. My dad gets tickets on bikes all the time. I mean, people get ticketed on bikes. People in in cars, you know, get away with things all the time. You know, you can't enforce a hundred percent, but you know, making someone sign a contract that's going to impose special liability on them, or or asking the NYPD to to crack down harder on it, that is imposing a special enforcement mechanism on people riding bikes, which is something that we're trying to encourage. That's all I'm saying. Anything else that Education. Okay. I, I'm just um, last I just want them to sign a contract that they understand that it's illegal, oh, so okay. that they will not do it. That's all I want. I, that would that I'd be fine with. If you want to put it in the terms, or you know, if you can get all the car money. drivers to sign something too, that would be perfect because yeah. they do so many illegal things. It's crazy. Yeah. But anyway, I don't want to waste the time of the city bike people. If you have any more comments, make them specific to the proposal that they brought forward. Betty, I just want to say the very first thing is please write into the resolution that no city bikes docks should be on a sidewalk. Is, I mean, to me, that's that's the least that city bike can do to go towards um, helping to educate and and mitigate the this issue. Betty, can I can I chime in on that one? Well, no, because one, there isn't going to be a resolution, but two. We can talk about that when the city bike people leave, but too, we have been on record with that particular point in the past as have well, other community boards. Well, we're not on we're not on record for that particular point because there's one specific location, the west side of Chamber Street uh, by West Street, where right outside of uh, you know like outside the building of uh, uh, Stuyvesant, that's actually a perfect location. It's technically a sidewalk, but it's so wide there. That it's not in, it interfering with any of the joggers or any of the people walking there. So to make it a black and white thing, while it might be better not to have it on the sidewalk in most places, there are places where it makes more sense because of the space. So I just don't want to make it, it like nothing is 100%. And when we say that we're against it 100%, that's a perfect location where it works great for everybody involved. True, yeah, and that you, is it more of a plaza than a sidewalk. Okay, but that. Uh, but anyway, okay. just to Lance, there was something in general that's been on record. Okay. To answer that question. Um, but anyway, is everyone spoken? Because Eric. Be, Betty, before you move on to the attendee section, just a point of inquiry. Um, DOT is going to return with uh, more to the infill plan, or is this just a? And just to refresh me, this is a first pass, um, or is this a, a, a final? Is this the final plan? This is this is our proposal for this for this year. So we won't be coming back <laughs> this year. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, um, Betty, I'm not able to lower my hand. Just so you know. Okay, I was just going to ask if the hands up are there because people have a question. And I just put mine up again because I really want to understand then how we stop the proposed site at Greenwich and Rector. Or how we review it or. Well, let's go it. look at it first of all, because it's replacing parked cars, then it's not creating any more compression than is already there. So I, yes, I, have, to honest, is, I have to look in, at it. In Greenwich South, there are very few parking places, spaces, places for even businesses to pull over and unload and load. And the last thing we need in this tiny little area with five working streets is is a bus station. We could take it offline and discuss. Great. That's ideal and we'll do that. Uh, 
there's somebody in the attendee section, if they could be unmuted, named, listed as Lynn. Okay, well, Lynn is gone now. Um, yes. What? No, they're what, on the panelists. Oh, now. I made a panelist now. Whoops. And you're free to speak. Oh, uh, no, I have nothing to say. I, I was... Okay, well, then I thank everyone for the presentation today since there are no other questions. And we'll Sorry, I'll go offline with that. Way. Yes comment uh it's not related to this presentation i just uh lauren you had mentioned and this is actually the reason why i raised my hand initially uh the second time um i just really wanted to thank you. i'm i was excited to hear that you uh are having some conversations about with the uh, the port authority about citing um pot potentially citing a, a dock in the world trade center um i really do think that is a big hole in the network and there's um, so much available space. So, um, just, I wanted to say, I'm excited to hear that, uh, and hope that there's, uh, hope that there's some, you know, fruitful developments in that area. Um, and then I just wanted to secondly say, uh, I just want to thank you guys again for coming, you, you know, you're this, you guys were armed with more, um, data and information than we've had in past, um, discussions about, uh, city bike and city bike infill. So, um, thanks for coming and thanks for being prepared. We appreciate it. Thank you so much. Jackie, this is Lucian. Yep. Um, can you send me the um, presentation as soon as you can for our records? Uh, sure. Yeah, I can. I believe it's going to be posted, so I can definitely send it to you. Yeah, it's uh, it's posted, but in the chat, I can quickly add the direct link to our website where the where the presentation is. Beautiful. Thank you so much. And um, Betty, just want to let you know that uh, Nick Bordone, um, I oh, hi, Nick. him over. He he might have something to say. Oh, Nick, would oh. you like to speak? Because one is in Battery Park City. Yeah, just real quick. Hold on a second. Let me put myself on the camera Camera here. Hey, guys. For those of you who might not know Nick, he is a member of the Battery. He works for the Battery Park City Authority. Hi, hey Nick. there. Hi. Hi. Good to see everybody. Sorry, I'm just uh, kind of doing dinner slash other stuff here. Um, so, yes, I spoke with uh, DOT briefly on this. And, Betty, thank you for having me. The only thing I just wanted to to um to go through briefly i don't know if we went through the specific locations but uh stuyvesant plaza i think was brought up which to us i think seems to make a lot of sense as uh who was on the call who mentioned it but there was a there was a mitch i think brought it up there was a lot of space at uh at stuyvesant plaza so yes. that would seem to be a place that would be uh certainly certainly open to having more more docks added or more info a couple of other i think locations that were that we're uh, banding about is extending uh, or adding new ones. I think one was on River Terrace and one was on. Uh, yeah, we're Warren dead ends. On right, River right, right, right. Which may help us on a, may help us on a couple of items, especially with uh, respect to cars parking or that shouldn't be. But the other item is, um, I think, Albany between South End uh, and uh, the Esplanade, I believe, was another location that's a potentially new docking. Mm -hmm. um, all of which I think is, is is great because as many on the call would share uh, the view, I think we want to try to uh, incent more people to cycle and the uh, more availability there is to both pick up and dock bikes, I think the better. The one concern I would just raise is we had spent some time over these past few years making sure that folks who were bicycling into Battery Park City and past it, whatever the means, privately owned bicycles or city bikes, um, try to use to the extent they can the Hudson River Greenway itself right next to West Street as opposed to the Battery Park City Esplanade. Not that we don't want bikes on the Esplanade, but as it is a very crowded place that is as it is with children and parents and folks of uh, varying age and mobility, um, when bikes are speeding down there, um, it can be just an added kind of uh, consideration for folks. So we have made some concerted over effort over the years, especially through the bicycle working group back in, I want to say 2017 or so. Um, to remind folks that the quickest north south route when you're passing down this way is to stay on the greenway on the Hudson River, River Greenway. So I guess if we're replacing new infill stations at places that are closer to the esplanade. That will make people think then, well, I'm right here. I'll just jump on the Esplanade. So 
if there's a way with either improved signage or improved education to remind folks that while the Esplanade is open to bicycles, the best way to go north south is the Greenway. I think that would be in keeping with what us and the community board have been working after for some time. Sorry, that's a long way of saying maybe we can remind folks they should stay on the Greenway. That's all. Thank Thanks, you. Betty. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Nick, sorry, you just finished all of some of your signage project because now you may have another one. We need some signs by the docks. It's, it's, you know, it's okay. We uh, were able to adapt. I just was something we wanted to make sure was, uh, was put out there for you all to consider. Yeah, no, and thank you. Cause I've had people since I live in Battery Park City for others, uh, have told me that they have to walk so far to get to them, people, residents of the community that I know there have been some asking to spread them out a little more closer to where they live. Right, right. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Nick. Betty? And Lucian, I guess you had one more question. Yeah, I have one question. Um, I don't recall hearing anything about Duane Street. Um, looking at the map, it looks like the bike share icon is moved to the south side of Duane Park, which is something that I believe CB1 had requested um, that the bike share dock be, be moved. Um, so is, is that part of this process or is there any updates about that as part of infill? So, I think this is, uh, you know, a little separate from infill, but, you know, we are moving forward with that relocation. Um, but at the moment that timeline is still TBD, but, you know, we'll definitely let the board know and, you know, update you. As that timeline is, you know, set closer and closer. Thanks, Jackie. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Cause then I guess that wraps up all the questions. I see nothing. Else, and I want to thank you all again for all of this information and. We'll get back to you if there are any issues, but looks good. Glad to see the expansion. Thank you so much. Thank you everyone. Thank you to the board. Have a good night. J Jackie, are you staying with us for the next item? Uh, yep. Yeah. Okay. Not it wasn't postponed, right? I don't think so. Uh, actually, they just postponed. Oh, okay. We postponed it. There we go. Was this the one? Thing? Okay. I'll see y'all later. <laughs> <laughs> see you guys later. Thank Take you. Bye, Jackie. Bye. Bye. Yes, yeah, you want to go on to the next one? Sure. I really have no information to be part on people. Uh, there is one. Let me look to see if we have enough for a. We do not have. A quorum anymore. I'm correct Lucian. Looks yeah, like I think you're right. We lose data. We lose quorum. Uh, Pat Moore, we need to make you formally a member of this committee since you come every month. <laughs> You don't get enough headaches on your own. We're going to let you join another. Uh, okay. Yeah. I, I, so I reached out. So for this, um, I, I did reach out to assembly member Glick's office. You'll remember that, um, she was the. 1 of the main sponsors in the assembly for the last. Go round of expansion for traffic cameras in New York city. Um, mm -hmm. this is. You know, just to go, I don't know if, if I should go all the way back, Betty, you can stop me, but, um, you know, cities don't exist in the US Constitution, right? Cities are animals of the state that cities um, only have as many, uh, the, the ability for city to make its own laws and rules um, only extends to the degree that the state wishes it, it, it be so. So for the city of New York, um, we do not have the authority to place traffic cameras wherever um, any of the city leaders or DOT uh, wishes. So um, currently uh, traffic cameras are only allowed within a certain handful of school zones and um, the, the number is capped and they can only be turned on when school is in session. Um, over the last summer, there were a number of um, pretty grisly uh, uh, car crashes in the news. Um, uh, principally from um, 
people who were probably drag racing um, and doing other sort of high speed antics. And um, they're not captured by traffic cams, red light cams. Um, so, um, you know, it is, there was a call for an expansion. Um, and then there's more, there's, of course, there's more um, uh, uh, rationale to the expansion, but um, that was the most notable um, that I could see. So, yeah, listen, I have some numbers I'm going to go through with people. Great. To see. Great. So, yeah, if you want to, and, and you fill in where, where it needs to be done. Uh, Michael, go to the next one. For pedestrian and cyclist injuries, I went to the New York State Department of Health, where, in fact, injuries to pedestrians are among the top 10 causes of injury related hospital admissions and deaths in New York State. It's for all age groups. There are approximately 300 pedestrians killed. 3,000 hospitalized and 15,000 injured by motor vehicles a year. And again, that's just the pedestrians. That's not the people in vehicles themselves, which is horrific numbers. At least 189 people, including 87 pedestrians and 12 cyclists, have been killed on, in crashes in New York City uh, from the beginning of the year through September 14th. So about Every three days, a New York City person, a person dies in New York City on the streets, a pedestrian. Reducing speed is important. Uh, according to the DOT, a pedestrian struck by a driver traveling 30 miles per hour, twice as likely to be killed as a pedestrian struck by a driver going 25 miles per hour. So it's not just the speed. I mean, it's not just being hit, but the actual speed is very sensitive to how badly hurt person is going to be. If you go to the next one, so it is a problem. Current New York State law, Lucent actually covered a lot of this. It only allows speed cameras from 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. on weekdays. Uh, cameras can only be located in 750 designated school zones. Only drivers who travel more than 10 miles per hour over the speed limit receive fines. Just something else that probably needs to be looked at since we saw how sensitive people, the severity of the injury is. But nevertheless, we don't have home rule anyway. New York City Department of DOT uh, was authorized to deploy the speed cameras within a quarter mile radius of the school zone. So of those 750, they actually have a, a quarter mile radius around them. And the DOT gets to choose which corners where exactly to place them. So that's a little bit of discretion that we currently have as a city. If you go to the next one, tickets and effectiveness. In 2020, there were 950 cameras located in school zones and they logged more than 4 million fines, double the 2019 tally. How much of that is, they were expanding the number of cameras and zones during that time. How much is just the craziness of COVID Nobody knows, but it's increasing. The DOT shows cameras reduced speeds by 71.5% and injuries by 16.9%. So there is a reduction. Cameras are effective in that sense. Two thirds of vehicles cited by speed cameras did not receive another ticket in the same calendar year. So it's effective in that way as a teaching tool as well. 75% of traffic fatalities happened in places and at times when no speed cameras were in operation. That's the big impetus for wanting more control over where they're located. 35.5% of all non-highway traffic fatalities in New York City took place in school speed zones with cameras, but during the times when the cameras had to be off. Again, another reason why New York City wants to have more home rule over the operation of the cameras. Enforcement consistency, again, to get back to equity here. In addition to being effective, uh, cameras enforcement removes unjust ticket issuance and ticket fixing. When the cameras ticket, they go directly to Department, Lucian, correct me, is the Department of Justice? Yeah, I'm not sure about that, Betty. I'm told it goes anyway. It goes to one of the city agencies that automatically tickets. It has nothing to do with it. It bypasses the NYPD. Is my point. And so it gets rid of two long-standing problems at the NYPD. 
They can't ticket fix for themselves and they can't not give tickets for themselves because they're not doing it. So it is more effective. Status of the change. Uh, at this particular time, December of 2020, Mayor de Blasio, you might remember, made an announcement asking Albany to allow New York City to control the speed cameras. Uh, currently, the government, uh, Governor Kathy Hochul does not appear to be opposed. In things that she said, she gives that impression. However, there are no changes or discussions being reported at this time on this issue. So, while we would not be able to do a resolution because we couldn't pass it, I am interested in hearing on people's thoughts on a resolution because it could be taken forward either to next month or to ask if executive committee would hear it. Before we go to the next one, I, th I therefore be it resolved. I'm asking for something very, go back one, something very simple. Asking the governor simply and our state representatives to pass a bill that allows local control of traffic enforcement cameras. Very straightforward, nothing about the details. Just let New York City make its own decisions. Are there any hands up for any comments on the issue? Michael, you can speak first. And then Eric. Sure. Uh, yeah, I was just going to say that. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm wholly in support of this. I think, you know, at minimum, um, uh, the ability that our, our Department of Transportation, the City Department of Transportation should have the, um, you know, authority and discretion to, I don't know, add this to its toolkit, um, whereas needed um, uh, an issue that I see um, frequently and what always scares me is um uh side blocks on side streets um cars uh um tend to go uh very quickly down side streets um if even if it's to hit you know a stoplight or, or something or other and you know as a pedestrian or a cyclist um you know those cars will rev up very quickly and they can get up to 40 sometimes even i think higher um on those side streets and that's just something that always um I don't know, it terrifies me because I know if I got hit by one, I'd be over. Um, so yeah, I, I think I'm in support of this. Um, uh, yeah, if there's any, I don't know if there's been any discussion about uh, um, sound monitoring, um, like uh, honking and, and mufflers and um, and uh, that sort of thing. Because I, I know that, um, I, I think they're illegal, um, but uh, it's difficult for enforcement. And I'm not sure if uh, automated enforcement has gotten um, has, has you know gotten to that point where I can detect that stuff yet? But um, I think I had seen that the NYC DOT was I don't know looking into it. Am I wrong, Betty? I am not aware of that. Uh, again, if we could, if Deborah Glick already brought one forward and it didn't pass, as much as this seems like it should be a fairly easy one, and that each region would make their own decisions. It's just local control. It's not saying New York City decides for everybody else uh, or that others even care to decide. And leave it with traffic enforcement because again, I don't want to get into all the privacy issues that could bog down some of the others potentially. If we could just stick with safer streets, reducing speeds and local communities decide that being government, I'm not saying. It wouldn't potentially still be voting. I don't think it's being turned over to a department. It would probably still go under the guise of city council, just as they make the decisions about lowering street speeds. Yeah, I think that's fair. I think it, it sounds relatively non-controversial to me, but um, back to you. One hopes. <laughs> uh, Eric and then Mitch. Yeah, so um, you know, I, I paid attention to the presentation. Um, so how many traffic cameras do we have in New York City? Because you said there were 750. Was that for the New York State or was that just for New York City proper? No, the 750 school zones are for New York City. That was the permission given by the state. Okay, okay. So it was that so larger number of 950. That's because it was 750 zones but a zone could have more than one camera since they have a quarter of a mile around the school zone, the school okay, itself. So we, we have 750 school zones in New York City? Correct. 
we have more so, than 750 schools but yes 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 so that means there's already an existing 700 and at least 750 cameras in new york city there were at least 950 that oh. were cited on that other day okay okay thank you thank yes, you it's close. i i think that's more than enough i pardon for the hyper i think that's that's a you know substantial number um and then considering this is new york city i mean we have schools you know you know you know if you're using quarter mile as as the uh you know within that zone i mean that gives the do you know new york city dot you know plenty of latitude and discretion in in shifting um you know traffic cameras as necessary i i think the problem is really enforcement um by the nypd it it's not it's using... not enforcement the cameras are the enforcement I, I, yeah, but I, I, I don't, I, I don't, pe people can have, can, can put piece of paper on their license plate and they've just evaded enforcement. That's, you know, some people, I wouldn't say don't care, but relying on this automated camera to, to, to solve a, a, a traffic issue, I think that's punitive. I mean, it, it doesn't take into account the road conditions. You know, the city wants to earn revenue, you know, collect revenue. I, I think that with 950 cameras within New York City, you know, with, with all the schools we have in New York City, you know, spread out, the DO, DOT has the flexibility to 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 um, to move cameras as they need. I, I think we got to improve our street design. Maybe we should start using more more speed humps. But this is another way of generating money on on from from car drivers. So I I I, I have reservations about this. Thank you. Okay, so I just want to remind you too, speed humps, the problem is city buses can't go over them. So that's part of the reason why that's a tool that's used fairly rarely. Uh, I see Mitch. Yes, okay, uh, I actually was gonna bring up something about the speed bumps, but not in the same way that it was just brought up because I agree, uh, first of all, I agree with most of what you and uh, Betty, with you and Michael said, and I wanted to come up with uh, Michael's point about the side streets, which you know is a real problem. Obviously, the, you know you're not going to you're not going to be able to put the speed bumps on the major thoroughfares because of what you said about the buses and and other things. But just from seeing how they work, a low grade speed bump on certain side streets where there have been problems in residential areas. I mean, I've seen how they work so well in other countries, and so it's not punitive. The only person when 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 you know if the person doesn't like tries to speed over it, and then they have to just pay their own fine by fixing the the underneath of their car, and not a high speed bump where that would impact bicyclists and other other you know other things, but just a low grade, you know, on those side streets, Michael, where you know I mean not flooding the city, but on areas that might be a problem, you know, because those things force drivers to slow down a little. I feel it's a win-win situation uh, on some of these side streets because we see how well it works in some areas outside of the city and in other international cities and residential areas. A low-grade speed bump. Yeah, no, I agree with you. I think long-term the uh, the goal is you know safer, better designed streets. Um, I just know that sometimes those you know those sort of improvements can take time and money. Betty, on those for DOT. Mm -hmm. If I can ask you, Betty, you were saying like, like, obviously, the, the, the city doesn't have authority to do certain things with with cameras, whether you're for or against them. I'm, I'm not I'm not taking sides, but on the low grade speed bumps on certain certain uh, side streets that are more residential. Uh, does the city have any uh, authority or does that also have to go through the state? No, they have the authority to do that, but it's not. The panacea you think it is, because I've been to multiple discussions. I'm not a traffic engineer. I'm right. not a road no, engineer. I, but there have the been multiple times. Wait one second. There have been Sorry. multiple times where there have been this issue on specific streets, and the DOT has brought up why they can't put a speed bump in that area. So, do you know why? What's what? What a general reason might have been? Uh, they were various logistical ones with. Okay. But personally, as a scooter user, I hate them. But. Well, I understand, but would you be, well, normally, and like I said, I say this totally respectfully, 
you're not going to be, I mean, unless you have to, because there aren't curb cuts or anything, you're not going to be riding in the middle of the street, in the middle of the street. So, uh, I mean, and, and like I said, I always defer to your situation. So, so, but in general, I think in some situations, a low grade speed bump might help what Michael's point was trying to make before, uh, as you know, anyway. Yeah, no, thanks for that. I appreciate it. I, I, I would say, I think, you know, I don't want to get into solutions or other solutions. The question is, and it sounds like people say don't move forward at this time with the resolution. Uh, so I will let that go. Uh, Jess, is that a new hand? Yeah, I, I was just going to say in, res I, in response to what you were just saying, I mean, I, I would be in favor of moving forward with it. I think it's a great idea. I just want to say that. When the time comes. <laughs> hey, everyone, this is Lucian. Um, I just want to also encourage you all to not just discuss the number, but discuss the. The hours in which the speed cameras can be turned on. Well, that's part of the home rule and that's part. That's really why the government, the mayor was also asking. Because we don't have, we being New York City does not have control over the hours or the locations. So that's yeah, part of the home rule. in favor of more local control of the hours and locations, as long as, you know, certain like things are not flooded just for revenue, but I would not be opposed to this as far as local control to have a better awareness of where things should or should not be. Yeah, like I said, this would still be a political process. It would just be New York City making the political process move, right. not Albany for New York City. We wouldn't be deciding for Rochester or Buffalo. They would do it right. themselves. And um, that's why I'm also not just asking for New York City. I'm asking for local control. The state could then choose to do what they want. They could name New York City separately or they could make it local control more general. Michael, your hand up again. You yeah, I'll just add that. Uh, yeah, again, I, I I think it makes sense. Uh, I think that the city has shown itself to be a more response. It, it would be a more responsive steward of, um, you know, uh, this sort of um, technique to achieve, you know, street safety. And it, it makes a little more sense than having New York City DOT have to go ask, um, ask, go up to Albany to ask to put, you know, uh, a camera on the street and within New York City, I think it, it just, it just would, I think would be a more responsive and efficient um, uh, process should it be run by the city. Um, and I think from what I've heard, I think it really is a, a major priority of um, the, uh, the new um, NYC okay. DOT commissioner. Um, uh, oh, so I think they are, I think the NYC DOT is making a big push to try to, to get this. Uh, but as you said, I haven't, heard that there's any traction as of yet. Well, that's why I was considering a resolution to move it forward, at least another voice asking them to think it again, because we can go to our own elected officials. Obviously, other state officials aren't necessarily going to care what we think. Um, nevertheless, moving it forward, because we've ha we've asked for things like Canal Street and others where there are real problems with pedestrian safety. Yet New York City has no control. They, they can measure and see where our big crash corners are. You can see it in open data, but they can't necessarily put speed cameras near the most dangerous places or use them at the most dangerous times. So they are an effective deterrent. The school zones have shown us that. Okay, I will move forward with it and bring it either, I'll bring it forward again, one point or another. But Thank you for that feedback. I will keep it simple too for that reason. Postponed, so you can move on. We don't have to worry about that. Betty, um, I have yes. I have an update from the MTA, just a really short one. Oh please. We have a new we have a new um, rep from the MTA and uh, her name is Jessica Spanton. She seems to be very on the ball. She comes <clears throat> from uh, Diana Savino, Diane Savino's office. Um, so definitely uh, 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 somebody who gets stuff done. Um, really appreciate uh, the the informa information she's gotten for us. Um, 
And the one update she got for us for the accessory adventure card. And I'm wondering, this person on there's a person on the phone who just raised their hand. Let me just see who this is really quick. Please. My person on the phone. <laughs> you can unmute yourself. I think it's star three. Yep. I think star three will unmute you. Hello, everyone. It's Marion with Assembly Member Deborah Glick's oh, office. There you go. There's Marion. Hey, Marion. Hello. I, hello. I just wanted to let you guys know that I am on the call and I'm taking notes, um, and I will take it back to the Assembly Member. Um, I just wanted you to know that we are here. Thanks, Marion. Um, yeah, but as I was saying in the beginning of the traffic camera item, I called um, Assembly Member Glick's office um, because right. I, I know that she had right. uh, had a, her hand in the last go around. Um, and uh, I know that they're probably interested in hearing more. So thank you so much, Marion, for being here and for, um, yes. And thank you, Betty, for, um, giving this presentation. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so uh, about the accessory adventure card, um, these are coming. Um, they, the MTA said that this was going to happen in late, uh, 21 or early 22. Uh, clearly we're, we're nearing the end of late 21. Um, but what's going to happen is, um, for um, people who have, um, uh, and so just kind of combining the metro card thing, um, people who have a low fare metro card for senior discounts, um, if you have one, um, when the Omni card is activated for senior um, metro card trips, um, if your expiration date for your current senior metro card happens uh, after the MTA's changeover, they'll mail you a tap card for Omni instead of a new senior Metro card. So you don't have to request it, they'll just mail it to you. And so that could be also uh, used for Accessoride. Um, also, I think it's supposed to be uh, early 2022, late 21 for that changeover as well. So that's, it's not a ton of info, but, um, and then fair capping, fair capping is also something that uh, they hope to have worked out very soon, but probably will be in the new year. Great, because I, I do want to hear both of those in the new year again yeah. with the access to ride. In fact, I just got my replacement card since I'm one of the people you were talking about. Uh, but in fact, what I want to just tell people the reason that I'd originally wanted to find out more about this is the access to ride Metro card will allow people who qualify for Access the Ride to get four free trips a day on buses or subways, including express buses. And I think it is part of the big move to get them out of Access the Ride, which is so heavily subsidized, and they're having problems with drivers. So they're trying to shift people more into public transportation by doing that. So I wanted to get information that could be disseminated more to the community. So yeah, Lucian, we'll keep after this one in next year then. Yeah, and, and Jessica will come in, uh, you know, we just made contact with her. There's a, a number of, of different issues around the district that I put on her plate kind of all at once. Once I met her, I was like, oh, great to meet you. And this, 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 this. So there's a couple of different updates that are coming to different committees. Um, anywhere you've seen some issue with MTA, uh, we just kind of were, they went dark for a little bit while they were getting us a new rep, but now she's on board and uh, is seems to be very good. Uh, one other PSA is that the Omni tap card is now available for purchase. Uh, I hear they're at 7-Eleven and Target. Um, the reason why you may want one of these tap cards when your phone may work just fine is, well, uh, if you have a, um, uh, a commuter benefits card, that's a credit card, uh, some of those cannot be loaded as the, the main tap card for a phone, uh, but they can be loaded for uh, uh, an Omni tap card. So you buy the tap card, uh, you set up an account, you add whatever cards you want to use, and you're good to go. So that's something you should keep your eye out for. Um, for those of you who have family or friends who uh, don't wish to use your phone, the Omni card is now an option, and uh, it can be refilled um, from the web. So, Betty, can I ask you a question about the accessor ride? That's something you just said about the uh, trying to push people to use public transportation. I mean. 
maybe it's just as a <laughs> from the outside looking in i mean people that need ac accessoride i almost feel it's kind of cruel to try to push them to use public transportation because no actually it isn't there are many people who are who can walk okay uh, they just they just is, thinking, it's a very I'm variable th crowd okay so for the but then like isn't it cheaper like weren't they trying to use like giving like uh, uh, people that need that you know the people that can't really walk uh, giving them vouchers where they can use like regular like like accessible taxis and it actually is cheaper than having to subsidize some of the accessoride things there are a number of issues with accessoride right now which is why i'm just as glad it's being pushed off till i prefer january because i was thinking about how do you write a resolution for all these problems there are some very recent problems too so i'm kind of glad that's pushed off Okay. But we will take on hopefully a lot of those in the near future. But some of that is being taken care of. Uh, and again, the Omni fare capping, which also will feed into somewhat Lucian is saying, I'd like to learn a little more about it too. Because now there is a tap card that you can use for those who don't use a phone. Uh, they are proposing, and what we talked about, Lucian and I talked about, was maybe moving forward with something. They're talking about doing fare capping. If you don't have a monthly pass, as soon as you've taken enough individual rides to be the equivalent of the cost of a monthly pass, this system would switch you over to a monthly pass and you wouldn't say, ah, why didn't I know I'd be traveling so much at the beginning of the month? I would have saved myself money. This is a way of doing that. So nobody pays more than the price of a monthly pass. Which is interesting. I think something we've got uh, to talk about. Yes. Sorry, carry on. I didn't mean to interrupt. I just wanted to know. I was looking at the participants. I saw that uh, Pat has her hand up. I didn't know if she had something. Yes, and there's that. a call in as well. So, Pat, if you want to speak first. I just what I you know an old person. I'm just asking a question about this Omni card. Do you? So you said as a senior, you when if your card expires, you'll get this Omni card. Do you have to get an Omni card? Is it? There benefit to an Omni card? Can you just get a regular card like you have your, your senior card? The senior card, well, the Omni card's gonna all Omni cards will replace all Metro cards. So mm -hmm. the, the and the Omni cards actually don't expire, um, but I think five years. Metro cards have a have a life a usable life of about a year, um, and then they need to be replaced. The Omni cards. Card, I thought the reason why we got our senior why they sent renewed senior cards because we have our photos on them there's probably a number of reasons but the the one of the big reasons is that metro cards um don't last very long but do you still get your car do you still have a photo on the senior omni card i'm i'm not sure if the new ones will come with a photo that she didn't say um, i will ask and make sure that we, we know if it, if, it, if that is the case um, but you, if your if your renewal date <laughs> is after the, the 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 period where they change over, you will get an Omni card. So I would assume that a lot of the security features that were on the Metro cards will also be on the Omni cards. Mm -hmm. But they should work on every single piece of transit that you use the Metro card for. I won't worry about it. We'll just get what we get <laughs> as long as we still yeah. get. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> and, and keep it interesting because the, the push that they'd said in the past was to get those with all kinds of benefits, whether it's fair fares, uh, whether it's student discounts, whether it's senior discounts, that all of them are consolidated into one system that has the computer capacity to sort people out and pass on the discounts to the different forms of transportation. This will also hopefully allow more switching to eventually pull in New York City ferry as well as buses as well as subways. Which is why I'd like to hear the update coming too with what time frame they're talking about bringing on these various modes of transportation within the Omni system. Lucian, can you stick with the caller? Oh, was that is that the same caller from Miriam? Uh, still Miriam, and, and Miriam, Miriam's unmuted. So if Miriam wants to jump in. She can jump in. I don't have anything to say. Thanks. Okay. Thanks, Miriam. 
Okay, well, let's go on to the next one because yeah, this is one that was asked uh, by the chair. Tammy asked us all committees to take a look at this and I guess it's, it behooves us since it's a DOT purview to take it more seriously. And as you're gonna see, I think we have a little bit of time to work on this, but she wants to start collecting data. On the DOT website, what it says, New York City is working to create a permanent open restaurants program. It'll be managed by the New York City DOT. It'll allow restaurants to use a sidewalk adjacent and curbside uh, roadway space. Adjacent looks like corner spaces would get it in front as well as next to. Although other things say the front footage, so that's not terribly clear. But this would be for outdoor dining. Uh, in order to make this program permanent, uh, the laws that control outdoor dining in non-emergency situations must be changed, which is why this is a process. Next slide. And so I, you can see this is also the DOT website, so anyone can check on it at any time. You can see this is going to be going on through the winter of 2022. The permanent program would not start for more than a year, 2023. As you can see, the design engagement process will be in, in spring. And you can see how many departments of the city are involved in it on the very first item, which is what they're doing fall and winter. And no, they have not yet made a decision on the text amendment. So th that's still in process, this first step. Okay. So just so you know, and we will get another shot at it in spring, fall 2022. When they talk about the CAPA process, you'll see later that's the rulemaking, which is what we consider the local, how things are done. Uh, it's part of our city charter. And you'll see some updates, some CAPA updates at the end, which will give you a better sense of what these look like. So next. The vision for a permanent program, just to let you know, do not confuse it with the temporary program that has been in place since it was it put it forward as an emergency. This would make it available throughout the city. That would be part of the text amendment. It would be allowable for removable tables and chairs, be subject to clear path and siting criteria, which is where I think we probably had the most in want to have the most input. Both sidewalk and roadway seating would require license agreements. So it's not going to be just self certification as the temporary program is. Both sidewalk and roadway seating will be administered and enforced by the New York City DOT. There is an enforcement unit that is coming, being hired and will be trained to come in, which again did not exist with the temporary program. Next. Uh, the, the DOT's comments about the new program that I've heard so, read so far, they will set strict rules about outdoor operating hours and noise. So they've heard that from lots of community boards. We can specify. Uh, require wider pedestrian clearance in the sidewalks. Outdoor dining will need to be removed from the streets for some months. And this is around snow clearance. So no structures can be there 12 months a year. Restaurants will eventually have to pay a fee. Again, this emergency system will be over and they will be charging. Again, we can somewhat opine on that as well as a community board. And city funding will have a robust enforcement unit, which as I said, is in the process of being created, but has not been functioning. Concerns about restaurants, I put together all the stuff so you don't think they aren't aware. I don't want this to just be a bitch session. But the concerns have been noise complaints, cleanliness, those about trash and rats, the poor appearance of many structures, including the appearance of the streetscape in general, the blockage of storm drains that exacerbate ponding and flooding streets, interference with snow clearance, which will be taken care of since they're going to seasonal will be have to taken down. The encroachment on bike lanes by some of the restaurants. One industry using to get to use public space for private profits has been a gripe of some of the community boards. Next. There are lots of complaints. 
noise using public space, restaurants using public space as a primary dining area, because at this point it's not tied to anything. They can have really almost all their dining outside. Limit sidewalk space for pedestrians, it's a big concern. Restaurant activities or structures outside of permitted, permitted space, such as near me, they have the customer lines are outside their space. The table service area is, the waiters come out into where the pedestrians are and serve the tables from that direction. The signage of the restaurants is out in the pedestrian area. Decorations uh, are out there and seats around the table. So this, the table might be in the designated space, but the seating for the table is in the pedestrian space. Uh, limiting curb access for those that are road beds and parking lanes for non-restaurant users. So there are a whole bunch of things and we'll look at it more systematically to try to get some input and I'll start collecting it. But I want you to know too, Assemblywoman Glick has been on this. Uh, so we have certainly what her opinion is. Some of her tweets. And you can, as you can see, they're mostly gearing around the appearance and the compressions that are occurring. So for noise complaints. We can talk about things like the hours of operation outdoors, the hours of liquor sales outdoors is really SLA controls the liquor hours. So that committee would be the one that can manage that anyway and would continue to do so. Music and any amplified sound that might leak. Uh, failure to contain indoor sounds, especially via open windows and doors. Lingering groups by the restaurants. The question here is, is this really a 311 issue? Is it really a responsibility of the restaurant or bar? Because can they really handle pedestrians on the sidewalk who <laughs> may not even be their customers? But I've heard these complaints. I want to go back and just hear if there are any initial comments people have to make about noise. Because again, I'm sure Pat's committee is going to be taking this on, and so I see her hand up. I'm not looking to take this over. As I said, all committees will be responding. This isn't. I, I, I'm just going to say that. Speaking. Thank you, Betty. You did a great list. Bring it to quality <laughs> of life. We'll be talking about it. But I don't know. I didn't remember seeing if you were on last night with um, landmarks, land use, land use. Because no, I was, I was not. Seeing, yeah, last night they had a really good discussion. And of course, there are quite a few architects on on the um, on that committee, Patrick's committee, and so we had a really good discussion. But one of the issues that I didn't see on the list, I think your list was drainage. Uh, Vicky Cameron brought up a problem with drainage. I know it was on the list, and I know that it is on Alice's radar that her committee will really concentrate on that. Yeah, and so you know, of course, noise and you're you're on quality of life anyway, but noise and rats and all those lovely things, sanitation will be discussed at quality of life. Um, and one of the things that I brought up last night, which I just threw out there, you remember years ago when when um, the um, newspaper stands all had to become uniformed, and if you wanted to open a new newspaper stand, you had to buy this this unit that was already, you know, this um, modular unit that had been designed. I don't understand why we haven't done something. If it's going to be a permanent program, why we aren't proposing something like that for these um, uh, outdoor restaurant dining sheds, because they come in all different sizes and they come in all different materials and they come in all different designs and some are fireproof and some are not. And I just feel as though, I mean, there, and a lot of them are just plain ugly. I don't know why we don't have a requirement that they all be kind of uniform. And then if you want to decorate them inside with your individual style, that's fine. But maybe the exterior should all be very similar in materials, size, look. That's just the proposal that I had. Uh, Michael, because again, standardization brings its own problems because it doesn't allow different neighborhoods to have their own. 
I mean, maybe they're, you know, three different sizes. Maybe it isn't that there's just one size, but that they somehow all have some standardization involved with them. It's, well, I it's realize, a oh, yeah, and a lot of the stuff that's out there right now is illegal by even the, is not in compliance with even the temporary yeah. rules. Yeah. yeah. So, can't be so wild west. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. Yeah, sure. Um, I'll, uh, yeah, thanks for yeah, putting this together. I will start by saying I am a big, in general, I'm a big fan of, of outdoor dining. I think like, yeah, since the pandemic hit, I think 90, maybe even more higher percentage of my uh, dining experiences in uh, New York have happened outdoors. And that's been a real, um, I don't know, a pleasant change of pace, I feel like in the city. That said, I, I do agree with everyone that there's obvious improvements that can be made. I'm trying to think, um, it seems like a lot a lot of these are recovered from a from a transportation perspective. One thing that um, I would be in favor of is um, some sort of rule that increases uh, visibility um, through um, uh, dining sheds. Uh, just uh, um, I think similar to how we talk about like um, how daylighting around curbs is really important, like even around these sheds, um, it can limit uh, pedestrian or, or even um, you know or drivers. Uh, sites of, of people crossing and what's going on in the street. Um, so I'd be in favor of uh, more, more minimal, um, uh, I don't know, but I guess maybe minimizing the like uh, restriction or the, the guidelines that they have. Cause I know there's some like strict guidelines about, you know, you have to have a wall this thick, et cetera. That I'm not sure is really backed by um, traffic safety, um, anything from traffic safety. So I think maybe cutting down some of those requirements and adding some sort of visibility requirement would be helpful. Oh, that's interesting and certainly appropriate from my perspective. Thank you. I'll go right down the line. I'll I see Tammy, so why don't you speak since you're a new hand up? Oh, no, I'll wait to the end. Let's see what everybody else says, but uh, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to join. I just got off the Hudson River Park one, so I have thoughts, but I'll wait. Okay, great. Let's hear from Gerald then, and then Mitch, and then Tammy, it will be your turn. And then the call-in user. Thanks, Betty. I, I don't want to belabor this because we did have a very good discussion about this last night um, in, in our meeting. Uh, but in pertain, pertaining specifically to transportation, um, <clears throat> you know, we had uh, City Bike on earlier today, of course, uh, or earlier this evening, and um, I guess I'm the question that I have is is why is there not a larger street by street survey happening um uh, after I got off last night's meeting and I'll give credit where credit's due my my wife actually we we were discussing this and she had a very interesting uh perspective which was you know why aren't we not just expanding the sidewalks and basically restricting the streets at this point um it, you know th at least this way we could have sidewalk cafes up closer to the buildings where they are and extend the the um you know the the dining areas out into the streets and it sounds like dot is willing to give those up and whoever else is willing to give those up um but i guess my question again is is uh, open streets is is not something new it's been something that has been discussed for many many years it's been supported by urbanists and and urban planning folks for quite some time um, and New York City in particular, there have been numerous uh, groups out there, whether they're student groups or whatever, who have done these sorts of studies and presented proposals. Uh, Open Streets in particular, I think, was designed for communities um, to take over the street more on a weekend, uh, on a, on a uh, lesser grand scale. But as far as Open Restaurants is concerned, um, I don't know. I guess I'm just. Uh, I don't know how to phrase the question other than why are we why why is, why is the city not looking at this holistically, from an urban planning perspective, um, and at this committee, I guess my question would be, what are these open restaurants taking from our streets, and uh, what are they doing to our transportation arteries? And are we are we willing to are we willing to give that up whatever it is that they're 
that they're uh, taking from us or, or asking of the communities? So I guess there's three questions there together. Um, I don't have any answers for it, but. Well, some of them we're going to be exploring a little bit later because it's really when they talk about in the street, they're talking about the parking lane, which kind of denotes should the parking lane be for just cars anyway. But then there there are layers of questions, and we'll we'll you bring up some good points, and we will be addressing them more. Yeah, I mean, it seems like if we have corridors worth of uh, restaurant open restaurants, that's one thing. But then we issue of equity and then we're transferring real estate uh or regulating real estate to only certain corridors so it's 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 quite a can of worms that we've opened up here um i feel as though the committee meeting last ne night not to speak on behalf of the committee but um there were a there was a number of folks who mentioned that perhaps this shouldn't be a permanent program after all something to think about. That is one choice, one option. Thanks. Thank you. And Mitch? Yes, hi, Betty. I would like to make two points, uh, and I is very comprehensive the, the way you laid everything out. The thing that you have at the very end, ideas, is this a DOT issue or New York City Health and DSNY issue? I would rephrase it because I feel it's all of the above, not either or. So, my suggestion on that is I, I, I think it's all of the above. It's not just one versus the other. Number two, uh, to piggyback on something what Michael said before, I definitely, uh, an idea that I would think would be uh, beneficial and wouldn't hurt anybody is on the traffic side of the, uh, the, the restaurant, the shack that's like, you know, right on the, off the curb, uh, a re little reflectors. It doesn't shine light into the buildings or the apartments, just like you might see on a, like a, a country road. A little, little reflector on the side of the uh, outside of the, uh, the, on the traffic side of the thing, I think could be uh, something that might prevent some uh, unnecessary accidents, especially when a driver is not paying attention. Interesting. Sorry, I'm writing, I'm jotting that down. Although I'm not really part part of the, um... It sounds like not that's already part of that's already part of the uh, DOT requirements for these places. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Uh, can you hear me now? That is already one of the requirements of a restaurant shed. Okay, well then, then you know that's a good thing. I just don't see them on all of them, or or not like really like in 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 a situation that's prominent. So uh, then, I guess yep. it just needs to be a little more enforced, and you know. But uh, all right, thank you. Yeah, the uh, the the eighteen inch walls are also supposed to be now filled with sandbags. That's also not um, enforced. There's there's a lot of enforcements that that is not taking place right now. That's why I said most of the stuff now doesn't comply with even the temporary rules, okay. and, the, and the permanent will be stricter. I mean, they have to. But be that stricter. seems like like the restaurant themselves. I mean, it costs them almost nothing just to put up little a little reflectors, you know, and. Uh, just to get them out of a, a little problem. Uh, uh, anyway, thank you. Yeah, no, we could certainly support that continuing. Tammy, floor is yours. My question is, what other ideas that have we not considered from a transportation perspective that could We're be getting to utilized in the same amount of space? So, for example, um, you know, Trisha, I. With the amount and the rise of scooters that we have here, right? If we're taking a look at potentially increasing the revel, increasing lime, increasing all of those other uses, then perhaps a use of the sidewalk area, not sidewalk, the street and roadbed should be to provide for parking locations for that. Simply because if we continue down the path that we are now, with them parking in between cars, they're until they're out in the middle of the street, they're almost invisible. So it's it's a safety hazard that you can look. And if we're really looking to transform the city, then we need to provide places where they can dock, places where if they are electric, they can recharge. So that's a consideration from a transportation perspective that I don't I haven't heard anybody in the city talking about. My concern and my thought process for what we're trying to do here is to think of 
they're calling it open restaurants. I'm calling it an open way to transform the streets of New York City. And while restaurants may be one of them, what else is missing? What else would we in a positive affirmation way want? Well, I'd like to see a place where if my kid was riding a scooter, they could find a place to park it and lock it. There's an, and whether that's motorized and part of that stream of revenue that the city is getting, or it's their individual scooters. You can't find a place to park those. And if we're talking about in commercial or mixed use zones, you should be able to provide opportunities for everyone. I mean, and it, I have some crazy ideas, which I'll wait for executive port that they're kind of wonky. I'm just talking transportation uses at this moment. And the other question I would have is, would there be a place that you could potentially buy a Metro card kiosk refill? Or I know they're all going Omni, but some people don't have Omni. Are there, are there areas that could be for people to refill? That are up top instead of down below. Sorry to jump in, but that's that is a problem. That's a great idea because if a lot of people just going down the stairs to access to refill a card, you know, accessing the stairs is really difficult. And I've been in situations where in Queens where I'm not by a um, a train station, and I don't know how to fill my metro card uh, to get on the bus. So that would be that'd be a great idea. So about the as one solution, as one partial solution, Tammy and, and Pat, newspaper kiosks, uh, or or like, uh, you know, even giving certain bodegas the the the, uh, the ability, but at least news, newspaper kiosks. Well, that's that's one of the things, Mitch. When we're talking about this positive looks, there are plenty of places that people have requested to do newspaper stands that we have said no, it's too crowded. But if you're willing to give up the street road bed. To expand the sidewalk, maybe that's an opportunity for a newspaper stand. Well, at least, how about at least starting with the newspaper stands that are already there, and and like as as least as as a you know a, a baby steps, and then see how things go. But uh, you know, because there are existing newspaper stands, so it wouldn't hurt anybody if they also have the ability to refill carts. But Mitch, what I'm what the discussion topic here, staying on point, is what would the additional possibility usages be other than just straight restaurants okay. from a transportation perspective? Okay, sorry, I, yeah, I wouldn't know if I was just kind of responding to what Pat's I think, but you're right. I, okay, thank you. No worries. Let's so, go to the next slide. And Tammy, you can continue. So that's kind of, I mean, one of the, I think you. Betty probably put it best that now when I look at the sidewalks, um, I have a really different perspective looking at them because in when we were discussing this last time, you mentioned a particular sidewalk that in my mind was perfectly wide enough for everything. And yet you pointed out that it's acceptable in the roadway in that space that they're talking about are cobbles, which are brutal. Um, street just VC street for those who are, yeah, it's yeah. Vessi street, which uh, you look at that sidewalk and you think to yourself, well, wait a minute. Now I completely understand having walked it and fallen off my scooter on it, which wasn't wide enough. Just saying, um, yeah, there needs to be, I clear path needs to be clear path. Clear path needs to be level no signs no cobbles, a clear path accessible for all. And level, so it's not slanted as the one is by the target. Correct. So, I mean, I think that's a positive structure thing that that should be absolutely in there is a redefining of what clear path means from a city perspective, because clear path sounds great and everybody wants a clear path and nobody really understands that their clear path Oh, well, but you can put a sign there. Why don't you go, well, if, you know, go to the next slide. I think it's going to be. Yeah, space allocation, because I think that's a big issue of, you know, pedestrians are really what the sidewalks were meant for in the 1st place. Uh, so this you committee has already decided on pedestrian priority. Is their focus. 
So we have to make enough usable space available to pedestrians. Right. Yeah, the rest, we get, we get all the sign posts and the restaurants get all the clear flat space. It's not fair. Well, but the other thing is, I also want to see that if, if we have so much space, then I would love to see every single city bike rack in the roadbed and off the sidewalks, out of the pops. Because what it leads to having them on the sidewalks are the people who then get on and ride straight down the sidewalks. I think we hammered the team with that a lot <laughs> on the first item. Yeah. So, yeah, no, I think that's a pretty unanimous feeling. It's passed I mean, on. And I think, I think it's, I'd like to see if we if we if I had my dream of what the city would turn into, it would be that it wouldn't be restaurant to restaurant to restaurant to restaurant. That there would be other uses, as I said, you know, a way to be able to refill or gain. Maybe it's um, maybe it's an internet stop. Maybe it's an electric refill stations. Maybe there are scooter stations, scooter parking. Um, moped trash parking. Trash bins. Trash bins, compost <laughs> bins. How about if you don't um, I would save that for quality of life. But yeah, it's, it really it starts to become the pilot programs that we all wish that, that we had. It's a limited amount of real estate and uh, they're not making any more road beds. So we should really be considerate and get the widest variety of usage for it. And I don't see, I mean, I think that in waterfront parks, they should talk about mini parks and, you know, mini more trees, more green, more, more benches, more, I mean, you could redo the roads as the, if you look at the DOT handbook, the DOT handbook, when it does traffic calming, talks about, uh, you know, curb bump outs. And we've seen all over Tribeca where it's not successful. I can particularly think of the corner of Duane where Balloon Saloon is. No matter how many times they've tried to fix that until you put a full cement bump out there or trees, those things get run over every time. So really taking a look at seeing what roadbed opportunities you have, what is temporary and what is permanent, what can be done before we decide that uh, there's one solution for everything. We should really try and see what some of the ills are and cure more of them with the available real estate. And with that, I shut up. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's complex and I want the committee to realize we, we really do need to focus where we are especially listening to it a lot because all the other committees will be contributing and have their own areas of specialty where I assume they're gonna be focusing the most of their attention. Um, so again, we're going to talk at the various, the issues are the restaurants versus other private businesses, the stores, the vendors, the food carts, versus other sectors, the schools, et cetera, versus public purposes, like curb access for deliveries, drop-offs and pickups. I mean, there are so many things going on at the same time. And there seems to be a consensus that something needs to be done. And the DOT would agree so that's fine. So should the total sidewalk and street space be tied to indoor seating as the restaurant's first floor frontage, or should it also be tied to indoor seating capacity? The reason that this originally came to me was I can think of a place in FIDI that must have seating for 20, 25 people outside. They have seating for four inside. I mean, it's it's just impassable. They have the tables so close together. It's a ghost kitchen. That's the other thing. That's, I was gonna say, I'm sure it's a ghost kitchen. Yeah, there's, it's, you're allowing the rise of ghost kitchens because then they don't need to worry about any indoor space whatsoever to qualify. They can rely completely on outdoor and delivery. And so that's, I, I do think, what do people think about tying it to the indoor seating? Makes sense, buddy. Thank you, Mitch. I'll try to say oh, there's another fight I establishment that I counted. They, uh, they're posted at 62 
62 people and I counted seats with the outdoor um, sidewalk shed and their takeover of the pops. They're now at approximately 350. Yeah, no, it's, it's out of control. And I can think of some others where I can't even get down the sidewalk and I'm on a narrow scooter, so I don't need a lot of space. But they have tables against the restaurant on the side, as well as against the curb, as well as in the street. This particular establishment is serving alcohol. They only have two small bathrooms, so I would definitely support tying it to the... Uh... <laughs> to the indoor seating. So, yeah, no, I think that's something yeah. this committee should probably put forward. Uh, to put some cap on it. I uh, should the sidewalk width include the painted sidewalk extensions, because that is one way of widening and they're doing it on. And this street is eluding me at this moment. What's next to where the bull is? Um, is it Whitehall? Yes, Whitehall. They're, they are going to be using uh, painted extensions or in other places. Should that count? And, and I, as I've complained before, for those of us who can't go up and down curbs, if they take up the whole sidewalk, then I can't go to any of the stores because I can't get past the restaurant space. I think you answered your own question. Right, I said, well, the, the answer, um, even surfaces as Tammy was talking about before, the part that has the brick or the like cobblestone things, the part that has the ramps in it, that's usually the outside portion that's given to the pedestrian. None of the glass sidewalks in historic Tribeca should be included either because there are weight restrictions and limitations on that as well. So if you include that as clear path, potentially it, it doesn't work either. And Betty went the also including clear path where the only clear path is uh, walking over grading where, you know, whether it's women in high heels or other people with other disabilities. That that's something that I think uh, should not be considered totally clear path. When it's just grading, like from, you know, where, where that's counted. Again, I know what you mean. That, that's an interesting. There has to be some yeah. solid ground, maybe not eight, right. maybe with, with this grading, you don't have to have eight feet, but there has to be some solid ground for, for certain segments of the population that, that can't walk over grading. Yeah, thank you. That's an interesting. Um... I, I can't help to think that this is just gonna be a matter of time that all of these um, sidewalk sheds are gonna be pouring concrete, extending the curbs out. It's logical the next step. I would think so. I, I can't hear you, Gerald. In FIDI, where there's almost no street already. <laughs> so, no, it'll be interesting to see how this continues to evolve. Um, uh, um, I just, since it's transportation, we're talking FIDI in particular at the moment. I will say I talked to the restaurant owner, you know, from an equitable standpoint. I mean, there's, there's a restaurant owner. Um, on uh, on Rector Street, and that's a one-way street with parking only on the side. Uh, he owns two restaurants, and he's unable to have outdoor dining, and yet two or three establishments across the street have outdoor dining. Um, you know, so there is an there is an equitable issue here taking place as well. Yeah, no, we've gone around and. You know what the DOT said to us directly about that, Gerald, right? I don't. No. Please, Tammy, inform me. That's the brakes. They're on the wrong side of the road. Of course. Yeah, I expect a number of people in restaurants will relocate. Well, also and, unfair, and, and that came up last right. night. If you have a corner site, you have frontage mm -hmm. on both sides as opposed to just in the front. But I do think that that's an issue because when you when when corner locations are allowed to place in roadbed and sidewalk on both, you're obscuring. It, it impacts the safety and the ability for for the interaction between any wheeled vehicle and any pedestrian. So it, unless there's 
there needs to be positive rulemaking for that. You know, at the corner of Washington Street and Rector, there is no stop sign. Uh, so that's a people are coming off of West Street down a one way street with parking on one side now with open restaurants or restaurant sheds rather. Um, it's extremely dangerous because people pick up speed off of Rector and, and continue barreling down the street with with the sheds on on the right hand side. So uh, those are just some other thoughts to, to keep in mind. I think um, uh, Michael had mentioned earlier about um, from a transportation standpoint, ability, and uh, a lot of these sheds have, have become fully enclosed at this point, and there is no visibility or through them. Well, and I think that is going to be an issue. I, I don't think because it would, they were never supposed to be more than 50% enclosed under the temporary rules. Have you seen the Tribeca Kitchen one? Oh, no, I, I've seen all kinds of things. So I'm saying most do not comply with even the temporary rules. But I haven't seen what is going to even be put forward for how much enclosure in the in the permanent. And should that be an issue where you say no enclosure? You know, there can be an open roof, but no side enclosures. I think partial with walls it being or DOT, they, you would think with it being DOT, they would have this design data available to them, but I mean, none of us have seen it. So they haven't made the rules yet. You saw the time frame. So if they have it, they have said they're not at that point. The text amendment's not through the process yet. And and why is city planning not championing championing some sort of uh, citywide de design threat on sorts of things? I don't know. My guess is the mayor wouldn't, and those who are looking for this to be a legacy um, left piece of legislation don't have time to get it done. I, the legacy is basically a, a mess that that we're all going to work with. Uh, I mean. Sunday, we were sitting out at Laughing Man and had a rat come up on our shoulder, literally. <laughs> so, okay, uh, enough. I'm sorry. Well, did you see the article in New York Times related to that, saying that many of the people who are supposed to be looking into working with rats and others were relocated to work on uh, vaccination sites? And so that a lot of that manpower was taken away from those. Which is hard was... the explanation. They, they went to all the reasons why the rats are so out of control right now. And I thought of you, Pat, because I know we're, we're the rat people. But... You know, on, on the news last night, also on, on the, the 11 o'clock news, it said because a lot of the the open, the, uh, the restaurants and the, the extra trash on the street is contributing to the increase in rat population besides, you know, the reason that you just mentioned. It Where's is, but it's hard to quantify I... because the sanitation also is not operating as much either. Exactly. Where's the dry ice when we need it? <laughs> that was the only only good thing about the pandemic. The rat there was like the streets were clean <laughs> from rats. Although, since this is being recorded, I I'm I'm going to have to officially say I was just I was just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so everybody is for for the first floor frontage. And trying to clarify a little bit with when with that being said, why are they allowing them on the side when they're talking about adjacent to? So I think that needs to be clarified within the rules because the DOT seems to be going on both ways at this point. Uh, should the sidewalk width include sidewalk extensions? You're saying no, it probably shouldn't. Same with the uneven surfaces, it shouldn't. Uh, space created. Now I need terminology help from, from Lucian and Tammy here. Space is created uh, of a building setback or other zoning agreement that allows increased building volume. That's been created where there's more sidewalk space. That, for that reason for volume and now some of them own restaurants and want to take the space back. It's like, are you kidding me? No, it, no, they've already been given their bump. So, again, people agree then with the, that should not. That space should not count within the width of the sidewalk calculation. 
Correct. And what we're looking for is an affirmative affirmation for what we think it should include and what it shouldn't include. So I agree. I th that's I think we really need to specify how that is calculated. Uh, what is, is requiring any, restaurant barriers to is, form is a there any concern here, Betty, about I, maybe it's not transportation, but is there any concern about FAR about the stuff being calculated within the zoning, the the FAR? It's it, within sidewalk calculation is what they would do. I'm just talking about what the DOT counts when they look at the sidewalk and they they were setting up. If you leave X amount of space for pedestrians, the restaurants can have the rest. Well, is that true? Or should some of this space, that sidewalk, so to speak, not be counted in the calculation that could benefit the restaurants? Well, I, I would just say that the, the outdoor seating probably wouldn't count as a building according to the zoning resolution. It but you, don't, you think it should be specified again within what the community road puts together on this? Honestly, I'm not. I'm not sure how much overlap between open dining and um, buildings permitting uh, uh, restaurants that are tenants um, to have some dining within their property property line. I'm not. I'm not certain just how much is unlocked by the open dining program to do so. It could be that a lot of them kind of figured out that it was a good idea um, during the pandemic, but I do recall that we saw sidewalk cafes um, before the pandemic that were on private property that we were like, hey, we didn't permit this. And they're like, oh no, it's actually private property. And they, you know, um, so, you know, I, I, do, I, would, I would just temper expectations on that part of it. I, I have a question. Why, and, and stop me if I'm wrong, why are uh, restaurants that already have outdoor cafes allowed to have side, uh, restaurant sheds? They're like getting two bangs for their buck. Why? They have an outdoor sh uh, cafe already. They shouldn't be allowed to use the roadbed to have additional seating. I think that the 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 most direct answer is that the sidewalk cafe program has been spun down and now there is only outdoor dining. So that program exists only on its own. The, so whatever you thought of before of the, the sidewalk cafe um, is no longer there. So the rules no, I'm sorry. are. If, what do you mean it's been spun down? If you have an outdoor cafe, you still have an outdoor cafe. Well, the, 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 the Department of Consumer Affairs and Worker Protection no longer has a program that we once knew. And so sidewalk cafe as a defin definitionally is no longer the best fit for what you see. What you see is the open dining allotment based on what's, what public space is available abutting and adjacent to that restaurant. But do you mean for new restaurants, they can't apply for an outdoor cafe, but for existing outdoor cafes, they still are there and being used. The sidewalk is still being used as an outdoor cafe, correct? They will be, all of it will be converted over to open restaurants. Everything is converted. It will no longer be. They will no longer have any seating on the sidewalks. They will just no, be. No, no, no. They get both. That's, that's what I'm that's saying. Though. Yes. Yes. It is yes. deemed, it is deemed available for both. Yes. Well, they, they, they played, they game the system. You know, well, I didn't see why they say... should be able to have both. Well, and some people just... have none. Right, but do we want to say that if somebody has sidewalk space, those restaurants are low priority for getting street space as well? If there are other needs for that street space, yes, yes, if they have the sidewalk space. That's what their outdoor dining should be. That's what it can, can, should consist of, and they should not be able to use the road bed. I thought the, the point was just getting back to zero before the pandemic to be at the same place you were before. And, and that was the whole point of the outdoor dining. And now, we, like, not to get plus zero, just back to where you were. Right. Well, and I think that's going to be the interesting question because, again, the, the DOT gets so many requests for use of this roadbed space that they can't, they're going to have spots that are very difficult to give the restaurants the space. And not put a city bike dock there, not put all the many things that Tammy mentioned there. 
Because there well, are so many demands. That's the consideration. If if you have a sidewalk that's large enough, then you get a sidewalk cafe. But you right. should double dip to have both. Right. And that should be a positive affirmation that if you are in the public realm with their sidewalk cafe, then you don't get the street and the streets exactly. have alternative use. They come it, back to us for our use. Yeah. It go back to the original use, whether it was a parking spot, whether it was a bike spot, whether it was, you know, blah, blah, blah. But going yeah, back to where we were. Yeah, exactly. Mitch, there's no going back. It's a re-envisioning of the future, unfortunately. No, no that's maybe okay. You know what I meant? It's like it's like I not getting what... plus, like like you know, going going back to like not gaming the system. That's what I meant. So we want to have some kind of general idea. I'm going to make sure I'm getting this right. That people not be able to overly utilize that they can't have sidewalk space, especially on two sides for a corner lot, as well as the street. And that's a, in all cases, or is that in just a priority of they really should be considered not? Why? Because some places in FIDI, the sidewalks are narrow enough, they can only put very minimal table space on the sidewalk. What were they doing before? Was that, like if they had three tables before and they were surviving, they had three tables before. <laughs> yeah, I just don't understand why they get all this additional space for free. <laughs> well, no, I'm thinking of some, if you can think of uh, De Claudio's was coming in and they had like two, two tops was all they could fit, because they had scaffolding in front of them as well. Well, that's a whole other issue, the scaffolding. There's always gonna be exceptions. But... Well, I was gonna say, but so there are exceptions. Uh, if, if, but if we, if we exception, walk this back, if we I think walk Pat was making back, a general point. It was, it, the idea was you could, you you wanted to, first off, it was having people outside. It was about, it was about air quality and circulation. And then as it was let back in, we were at 50%. And so I thought the whole idea was this this concept of, you know, fewer spaces inside, spread everybody out inside. What I don't understand is why is nobody talking about healthier buildings, making restaurants put in uh, energy or excuse me, air exchangers similar to a hospital, if that's the issue. I mean, oh, well, actually, now they're they're I mean, talking more about activating the streets, not so much. Not so much letting people address. back into the buildings. <laughs> okay. Well, they are. They can. People can go back in the buildings. Yeah, supposedly yeah. we're all vaccinated. I mean, now. I'm, I'm all for activating that. streets, so don't get me wrong. It's it's just a a matter. I guess I go default back to my whole idea that this seems to be a really huge urban planning conundrum that you know DOT may be great at enforcing it at some point, but I don't know that they're really on top of the ball for for designing it and and at least not not alone so i go back i default back to what what mitch was saying which you know i think is is it's all these all these uh departments need to be working together uh, and that is in the plan so yeah i guess one of our recommendations would be the an urban plan or get a bigger scheme because i think there's a, a lot of sentiment that there should be blocks like stone street that are really designated as places where a lot of restaurants have dining and it's known as kind of a dining street. Chinatown is same. Versus a, they could yeah. be anywhere. Makes sense. Okay. Should there be a requirement for barriers or some sort of known perimeter of the space that's allocated by the DOT that's permitted to them? As I said, I, I see lots of people, they put their lines outside their customers in the pedestrian portion, they put the servers come outside and serve over to the tables. Um, so the Betty, I said the answer to your quit to the question mark, I would say my yes should take place only within the allotted space. Because we had this before be the pandemic. Known. Before the pandemic, there was a problem. I forget it was whether it was licensing or quality of life, where there were certain uh, establishments that were putting like like planters outside of like you know barriers that was causing certain type of of uh, problems on in, in, in pedestrian movement so i look at this as something the same it should, it should take place in the allotted space okay yeah and, and the allotted space should be demarcated so that the pedestrians know where it is 
I think that is the big issue for a lot of them. So what do we have any spaces, uh, uh, any of these outdoor restaurant sheds in, in, in Baidai, Tribeca area that are in the middle of the street? Uh, similar, if you go to um, the West Village, uh, we went to a place where the, the sidewalk sheds were, uh, the, you had the sidewalk and then it was a bike lane and then it was the sidewalk shed, and then it was the vehicular lanes. I don't know if we have any of that in our community district, but um, I'll tell you, I mean, it was crazy that the, uh, the, the, the servers were taking their lives into their own hands walking across those bicycle paths. We do have that. I was gonna say, most of the times that we don't, it's because the, the restaurants built before the, bike, the known bike lane went in. Correct, like the like the West Walmart. Broadway and Church. That's right. From 57th to 42nd Street on 9th Avenue, the whole way. And I ha I was up there the other day, and people serving like it, it was really like it was it was dangerous for both the servers and for the bicyclists. It's just an accident waiting to be happen to happen. Yeah, it's a well, little. Should we say that those restaurants right can't have roadbed space if there's a bike lane there? Transportation's more serve? important. I mean. I mean how do they serve? I mean, I'm not on either side. I just, I'm just on the side of, 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 of more common sense, but they have to be able to serve. So then well, it's no, either taking that. They're oh, taking sorry? the parking lane and the parking lane is what is used as protection for the bike lane. Right. So the restaurant so, by de facto, what the parking lane is, is on the other side, the far right. side of the bike lane. So on the protected bike lane, where, like I said, where I think what, what, the. uh, uh Gerald was saying, and I, I, I saw on 9th Avenue the other day, is the protected bike lane is, is an accident waiting to happen for both bicyclists and the services, the servers, and, you know, be, and, but there's no, the server has to walk into the, of course, the bike lane. I mean, they're just like turning both ways with their head and hoping that there's no accident. But the, I do see that that is a, some type of problem. Oh, so do I. I'm amazed the restaurants don't see it as a problem. Yeah. The servers do, the restaurants don't, but the servers right. do. Right. The owner yeah. doesn't care. The restaurants are making money. The servers are the ones taking their lives in their hands. But I, again, I, that's, that's an example that I, I, is a very interesting urban planning conundrum because here New York City spent, I don't know how many millions of dollars, and I'm sure they have, and people have spent countless hours coming up with new streetscapes where there are um bicycles that are protected from the vehicles through a line of parking but now we're going to take away that parking and put seated pedestrians no. <laughs> right next to the vehicles and in between the vehicles and the bicycles i mean i it's pure genius <laughs> It is. Well, it's cr well, you know, there's demand. That's where I think you should think what's really crazy. There's, but a, finite, there's a finite amount of space, Betty. I forget who brought it up, but like where it, it becomes the saturation point where pedestrians are not going to have everything they want. The bicyclists are going to have everything they want. The parking space is not going to have everything. But we, we can't put everything everywhere because that's one of the reasons why there's so many more accidents. There's a finite amount of space. Well, and that's what's not clear how much they're going to limit because there will be a charge for space that will no longer be free. Uh, which would pay the metrics the too. restaurant? The... Yes, rent will be, there'll be a fee charged for the permission to use the DOT space. And that money goes back to? City. But any, the, the general pot or DOT or? Do we know? I don't know that it has affordable been said. Housing? Tammy, have you heard? Oh, no. Go not yet. Affordable housing. There's no determinations on any of that yet. I was going to say, none of those details have been worked out as far as I know. Nah. I'd I'd love to... would love to get the money, but I doubt one department would get it. It would be nice if it went into a general purpose fund so it could be tracked, but it's hard to know. Um, it could just be a general, you know, pot. Put it back into the rat fund. <laughs> <laughs> no, it should be to build out better. I'm, 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 I'm serious. So let's so, get back to where we are, guys. 
Do we know <laughs> if these have to be taken down this year in October? Nope. No. Or, it, excuse me. It's no. already November. I meant uh, for snow. Uh, whenever. Twenty twenty three. They go into effect. Twenty twenty three. Okay. Supposed to have a horrible uh, winter this summer. This winter. <laughs> so if we have all this accumulation of snow, it's well, going to be your vehicles because they can't get through. <laughs> Well, or December of next year too, because we've had worse snow in December before. Because oh, we can wait till all the snow piles up, and then it starts melting, and we have floods on the streets, and these sheds start floating away. Perfect. <laughs> well, keep in mind, we still don't know what Eric Adams is going to do when he gets into office. So, so Betty, the next question you have is the minimum clearance space. Could could uh, we address that? Sure. Uh, is it should it, the is minimum it, clearance space, and that means for pedestrian space. Right. So it, it, right now it's eight feet, correct? I mean, that would be nice if it could be that. I don't know how practical it would be when, wish, you know, but that's would be optimum. Well, the, well, the question is, is it? People admit this is, we, don't, we shouldn't have to, Tammy, I'm speaking for you. We shouldn't have to worry about other community districts, but the rules made for the program will apply to all of New York City. In Midtown, there are very wide sidewalks and they still have problems during Christmas rush and other times. Quite frankly, we should be designing this program based on CB1 is a microcosm for many things. We have the narrowest streets we have the narrowest. and the narrowest sidewalks. We should be advocating and allocating based on what we need and then let the other community boards look at it and see what where they are. The, uh, CB2 has some of the same things that we do. Uh, the Lower East Side does as well, but everybody sort of has the same concerns that need to be addressed. Tammy, would you be in favor of keeping the eight feet uh, regardless of, you know, whatever else is going on? I I me on a personal basis, I want to redefine the space. I mean, if you're talking clear path, I really want it to be a clear path. That means no signs, no cobbles, no tilts, nothing. So right? that would be keeping the eight feet rule, at least. But, well, but it's it currently it currently isn't what they say it is, and well, that's the thing. We have a chance to make it right to truly make the city accessible. Can right. you explain it? What? Because I'm now confused. You said it, it really isn't what it is. So where, where, where is the uh, quagmire? Clear path allows it you to should be truly clear. It should be right now. If you look at the DOT diagram, they use the the space of the pedestrian is from the curb inward, so that eight foot space includes the it fire includes hydrants. The all it includes stuff, yeah. all of the signage. Uh, okay. As well as whatever people put into it as well. Okay. So that's the change by defining it saying, no, you know, we don't want the curb cut within our eight feet. We don't want the co any cobblestone decorative things that might be there within our eight feet. We don't want. And the question is, the way it's written now, it's eight feet or 50% of the sidewalk. Right. Goes to the pedestrians. If the sidewalk, whichever is greater. That's great if you have narrow sidewalks, but as it gets wider, should restaurants get 50%? I mean, it's really 50%. Should pedestrians get 60%, at least eight feet or 60%, whichever is greater? I personally think the pedestrians should get it simply because if you think about, right. you know, we're trying to create a city that's truly walkable and people, don't walk in singles or pairs necessarily, which is Not what really. original rules were all built on. There was no such thing as a double side by side stroller, you know. Like Ed Pinkar has. Exactly. You know, our streets were not designed for that. You know, they had to design, literally design strollers that are city friendly, so they're more narrow. That's why my scooter is the way it is. Right. It's so, we need, so we need to update what those, this is our opportunity to take a look at this and say, okay, here's what clear path really should mean. Here's what we'd like to see. 
we'd like to see the sidewalks. You know, we think 70% of the sidewalk should be for pedestrian. I was going to say 80, as a, what if we change it to more like eight feet or 70%, whichever is greater? Yeah. I mean, really, this is, this is the opportunities that we have to put this forward and to say, and there's no reason we're, we're basically giving up 100% of the sidewalk now in terms of it is public space, 100% of the roadbed that is public space and redefining it to a private usage. Well, let's redefine what that means because otherwise you're just saying yes. Betty, how about what, what like, like you said, certain streets in Midtown where the, 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 the streets are wider, maybe like define like past a certain width, then the percentage would, would increase like kind of what Tammy's saying, you know, like, uh, like where, where you can't give 70% maybe on Stone Street, but, you know, where it has to be like, you know, half or eight feet, but past a certain like wide, wide width, then the percentage of the pedestrian space increases. I would argue on narrow streets, it's an even bigger problem. Okay. Okay. But I'm that would be my idea. Street, you know, 70% at least should go to the pedestrian. Some of these streets are only three and a half, uh, sidewalks are only three and a half, four feet wide. Well, I think at that point, 100% should go to the pedestrian because otherwise the pedestrian is going into the, the street. And, well, that's and, why the, the restaurants won't get it. Because they'll have like half a foot. Let me tell you, Betty, if that was me, I'd put a bar counter that flipped up on the outside of my restaurant and stools. Because that's the only space that I could get. I'd take what I could get. Or an open window and you could just stand there, right? <laughs> that would be better. Tell we know it's not going to happen, in. even though it would be nice for us. We know it's not going to happen. So we have to like be real in, in, our, in our ask so that we don't lose the 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 you know the the main principle of of trying to get a little more pedestrian space well the reality i'll say the reality is in these very narrow sidewalks there probably shouldn't be any restaurants that have sidewalk space because the workers aren't back yet when they are you'll remember how crowded it is well and you got to understand there are some large companies that are not um there are large companies out there now that are really redefining what work means. And that's something that we should, we should think through because we are never going to be returning not or not in the near future to where, what we were March 1st, 2020, right? Where it's a hundred percent of the people in the office and people, it wasn't very favorable to work remotely because the theory was, well, you're not really, you're doing everything else. You're not really working. And then we had a solid year and a half of people working remotely and businesses saying, okay, well, we can make this work. So Citigroup said that they're only, we were at their ribbon cutting yesterday. Lucian, was that yesterday? I think so. Um, and they're working on a hybrid model as a permanent return to work concept permanent you don't have to explain this to me because michael i'm sure can tell you he's doing this himself yep. i used to run my husband's office when i was married from when i was in vietnam i just did it from vietnam so as a professor i used to go into work when i had classes and otherwise i worked from home now, so, i've been doing this for decades right so we need to really kind of that's why i'm saying let's take a look at this and really say what is the what are the other uses that we could use from a transportation perspective that we would want to see in the roadbed that's creative or you'd want to see on the sidewalk that's more creative right and i want to protect protect the pedestrians that's right pedestrian priority means not making space on narrow streets there still have to be some rules and well I'm and then the 70 percent all those benches that we have arguments over being in the right of way. Here's an ideal opportunity to do some traffic calming by doing bump outs with benches and trees. Instead of roadbed seating. I mean, there's options for those things. I don't understand why we aren't looking at that. I don't understand why we aren't doing uh, bump outs and putting and allowing food carts to go.
further out instead of on the edge of the sidewalks. I mean, there's, why aren't we talking about street vendor carts there? Creating, creating roadbed areas for street cart vendors. And I think that'll be a next year's district budget. Tam Tammy, while I agree with you in principle, I think one of the answers is it goes back to let's just take like 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 lower Broadway where we were talking about those uh, the street carts across from uh, I forget the, the Zuccotti Park, uh, you know because of all the placard parking, I mean it would be nice for those vendors to be in that first lane, but because of the placard parking, there's really just one lane going down there, and so it's almost like you can't do one without the other. Because like on paper, what you're saying is perfect, but without the placard parking situation being addressed, the other things become much harder to do. Hey, so I'm going to chime in on that as well. That's, I think, one of the issues with the city bike docking station at uh, Target. There's so much placard parking around there. It's not just the, um, the, the university, but uh, there's so much placard parking that, you know, that's one of the, I would believe that's one of the reasons that they're not in the roadbed. And Gerald, take a look and see, because if somebody can explain to me why an actuarial needs to have parking and can't park in a lot and they need, I, that's also on that block, just saying. Well, I say the city can give them city bikes. <laughs> they don't need cars. We can go after the size of cars and other things in the future. Be interesting with the new administration goes after. Right now it's kind of, it's definitely hey, a dock session. I'm against the placards, Betty. I'm with you, but everybody is not able to, you know, it, it, it's wonderful if it could be, but everybody's not able to do that, you know? So, I mean, we just, we still have to be real. Everybody is not able to do that. To enforce but, placard? No, I'm saying you, you, well, you maybe you just make off the cuff, like everybody is not able to just get on the bike and and go to work back and forth or whatever. I mean, the placard parking, like we all agree in the same thing, but everybody is just not able to do that. And I'm, I'm, I'm not speaking about myself. I'm just, you know, we have to be real about everybody's situation. Yes, no, I know I'm very aware of that. And in fact, just as I recently, and they were talking about something like 35% of the bicycle rides are done by 65 to 75 year olds. So. Yeah. I mean, somebody had mentioned, I forget who it was, and it was it was a nice thing. They say they moved, they were able, they moved uh, in an early discussion, they moved within walking distance. So they were able from to their work. So they were able to even, you know, not even have to deal with the city bike. And that would be wonderful, but most people can't afford to do that or don't have the liberty to do that. So that's just not, and, and, and not everybody works in the same place every day even if they could afford it. But most people can't afford to, to, to have the luxury to work in the neighborhood that they they, they, they live in. So, you know, we-, it we be have, nice we, to change that we, affordable housing at five real these Street things. Well, I agree with you. I, like I said, this is all, that's great. We'll have to have that before, like, like, like you know, <laughs> certain things on paper are, are wonderful, but, you know, we have to still have to be real about certain things while I agree in principle with everything you've both said. Yeah, no, well, I didn't really say anything about that, but. No, somebody made a Sorry, comment. One of the other members made a comment before that, uh, you know, he was fortunate to be able to move, like, like to cho choose to live within a close proximity where, where he worked. Well, and, let me, let me, I was the one who said that, Mitch, and I'll just say that it wasn't. That's I wonderful. Was God bless you. But, but no, it wasn't a choice. It My choice was actually looking for a job in my neighborhood after not working for a year because of COVID. Right. <laughs> that's what it was. And I was fortunate no, that's to wonderful. find a job there. Most people in New York yeah. don't have that luxury, let's, whether it's because of, All right, so let's know. get back right. to roadbed and usage and sidewalk usage. Yes, and I, do I hear anything against going to at least 70% going to pedestrians? You know, a minimum of eight feet or 70%, whichever is greater. Sounds good. Love it. The sidewalk. Uh, next one. Oh, reporting problems. I thought, you know, enforcement is nice, but 
they're not going to go out and find everything the way people on the street. Now we have all these pedestrians can spot things all the times. Enforcement will be helpful, but should we draw attention to the problems, especially photos in real time? Is 311 adequate is really my question. Uh, or should there be something with the DOT website where people can report infractions as well as posting yeah. Twitter as long as it's, you know, social media, as long as they send it to DOT, who's on all social media. You're talking about DOT in the context of reporting an issue with a restaurant chat? Yes. Then you well, know what I always Restaurant say. usage in general. Yeah, but you know what my mantra, it needs to be in real time. And yes, they should, you have DOT, if they're going to take responsibility for this, then yes, they should have inspectors working all the time. So, because restaurants are open late and, you know, they, so there should be someone there that people can call in real time while the problem is happening. Okay. Again, that's going to be more your committee than this one. And that ours will be structural. Well, I mean, it can be both committees. Yeah, taking we up all the same thing. Yeah. Right, but you're thinking more of noise and those things where the minute matters. Uh, that's I'm thinking about things like ask, those. Betty, is yeah. that the, that's a positive ask that whatever department of enforcement is set up is open. You know, until midnight or 11 p.m. Is that it's not there 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Yeah, is restaurants that the, and bars right now, open until two. Or yeah. Four. Is that the, is that the operating hours of the enforcement is able to do intake up until 11 p.m. at night? And until the hours of operation for open for open yes, restaurants, they can't are. be responsible for indoors bars and things because Actually, that's not a DOT program. Yeah. It's a DOT it, should be, it should be to an hour past the closing time of the program. People agree. What does yes. that mean? An hour past the closing time of the program. So the program, the program for road bent dining says that all outdoor dining, all outdoor cafes and stuff must close at 10 o'clock. Like people really all adhere to that. But yes, okay. Then the 11 o'clock. It should then be open until 11 because like, people. You know, we have the same problem in licensing. When it says 10 o'clock, does it mean they do, they know, they stop serving at 10 o'clock or everyone should be gone by 10 o'clock? That needs to be clarified that the closing time is the and is is out. It is not the closing not the time to stop serving. Right. Right. It's not a stop serve time. It's right. a close time. So that needs and then to be enforcement closed. bureau should be open for an hour longer because then you will be able to actually um, intake the problems in real time that are happening and document. Exactly. Sounds good. And the information should be publicly accessible and shared with the SLA. And, and reporting should be a little bit easier right now. You can report um, sidewalk shed infractions on three one one, but it's very confusing. Uh, first off, you apparently DOT has taken over this entire program already, uh, regardless of what's being presented to us, because you now have to go through DOT to on three one one to report. For example, in an abandoned sidewalk shed or any other number of, of issues, but uh, it, it's just a little obscure to be able to report a sidewalk shed that's not in compliance. Um, it, it, you would think that you would go through, for example, uh, DOB or or something along those lines, uh, but it doesn't work that way. Yeah, no, the program completely goes to DOT. Who has no enforcement, so it's pointless to report. Correct, correct. But people well, agree then it should be broadened beyond 311. Yes. Yes. Great, because I think that's been something that's really irked people as well. Any other comments? Because I just want to give you some quick updates and then that's it. Great. Well, think about it. We can always revisit this. I'm going to listen to a tape and put it together. What comments made. Thank you. A lot of good comments. Thank you, everybody. We really, we have an opportunity to get some asks in and that's really the goal is to do a positive 
affirmation. Here's not the problem. Here's where we see as potential solutions. Here are things we want to see. You asked what we want, Mr. Mayor. Here you go. And hopefully yes. Mr. Mayor will be able to help us with it. Where the rulemaking comes on, but you're going to see, if you go to the next, see some of the quick updates. I follow the CAPA process. And these are some of the rule changes that have been done recently. Uh, the dangerous vehicle abatement program, which was a local law that was passed, I think actually two years ago. Oh, there's something. Sorry. Uh, this rule sets forth. So the final rule passed and will go into effect later this month around this law, which is a local law that was passed in 2020. So for those with the dangerous vehicle abatement, if, if you go through so many traffic cameras or speeding tickets in a set period of time, then you have to go to an education program. They claim that's helpful. Other people claim some of the recent deaths have occurred by people who have been through these programs and clearly didn't change their behaviors much. But anyway, that's one change that's occurring soon. That's the CAPA process. Next. That's where they turn law into the rules. Rule change, extension of street fair moratorium and open culture program. This is effective in, on December 1st, a little different from what we'd heard before. But the uh, street activity permit office will, it was supposed to be not looking at applications throughout this year and next year. But in fact, the rule came out and Anyone who held a function in 2019 will be allowed to apply. Uh, we lost Betty, but I believe what she is saying is those who applied in 2019 will be given priority to reinstate their events. Did I get that right, Betty? You're back. Can you, okay, yes, in 2022. So before it was that nobody could, now it's those from 2019 will be eligible in 2022. So we should be starting to hear some, getting some requests next year. We already have them. Great, so, so for those who are newer to the committee and have never done them before, it's one of the responsibilities that has been postponed because of COVID. So that was another rule change. Next. Deborah Glick tweeted about how the governor uh, with funding New York with the big uh, federal package that just passed. The money that's coming to New York state, so you can see some of the money hopefully will be coming to New York City will be affecting subway service. Uh, clean school and transit buses, which means more electrical school and MTA kind of buses. 11 billion will go to rail in the Northeast. And three and a half billion for environmental remediation, which probably won't affect this committee much. Who knows? For bike volume, since we had asked for and got the movement of the Brooklyn Bridge bike lane, interesting numbers to see how the growth occurred. You can see the green is where they switched from the promenade down to the roadway and how bike growth and use of the bike lanes have been continued to grow. So Bike space is popular on the Brooklyn Bridge. Next, just a reminder, the next meeting in December will be, I switched with the environmental committee. So we'll be held on a Monday and it will be December 20th. So for those of you who like to plan in advance, it won't be the first Tuesday like usual. It'll be the day before full board, which is Tuesday, December 21st next month. So if there are no other comments. Um, Betty, I, what I would love you to do is some of the rule changes that have come out and the new things, uh, we'd like to get that into the newsletter on the weekend. That goes out so people understand some things, uh, changes a, changes a foot and agree. So uh, just transportation ones or all of them? Uh, we'll work that out with Lucian. We'll talk to him tomorrow or Thursday and figure that out what makes sense to go out this week and next. Okay, I'll check with him to see, he may get the same emails that I do. Otherwise I can just copy mine and send it to him and he can get the list. 
uh, I'll ask you just to give me like four line summaries. Highlights. <laughs> like you have here, because they're well done. Thank you. Well, no, it is kind of rather strange that the CAFA process where they change rules and they don't announce them and people say, how do you not know the laws in the city where you live? Because most people don't know that CAFA exists and we really exist by rules. Yep. And that's so these laws and, and other regulations have changed and they're not widely disseminated unless you get on there, you ask to be on the mailing list. First I've and, heard of it, Betty, so thank you. Well, yes, and that's why I try to at least mention the things for transportation at the end of my committee as updates. But if you're interested, I'll give you the information where you can link up to get their emails. They'll list all of the rule changes. Otherwise, thank you all and see you next week. We'll see you other times, but next month. Thanks, everyone. See you. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.